Hello, my fellow Westorians. I'm Aziz. With me is Ashea. And this is Valar Reredis. As we begin a feast for crows, Valar Reredis seeks to entertain while preparing you for the winds of winter. Many of the new plot lines and locations launched in this book are not yet resolved in A Song of Ice and Fire, taking us to our greatest heights of mystery yet. For the remainder of the Valar Reredis journey, we'll be looking ahead as much, if not more, as we've been looking back. But the core message remains true. The best books are those that hold up to repeated rereading. From George R. R. Martin himself. Yeah, he knows what he's doing, y'all. If you're watching live, you can feel free to ask live questions. We can't possibly catch everything. Feedback from fellow Westorians has been vital in making this show as good as it can be. You can also send questions and comments ahead of time by joining us on one of our social media outlets, including Facebook, Flick, Discord, and Slack. Make sure to check out the Isle of Faces podcast. That's Joe Buckley's show. He is in tandem with us on his reread and going through the chapters, so you get additional thoughts by checking out his show, plus a lot of his thoughts are in our episodes. Same goes for Nina Friel, but in Tumblr form rather than podcast form. You can check out her stuff over there on Good Queen Alley with one L, and her thoughts are throughout all of Valar Redis as well. If you want to support us financially, you can go over to patreon.com slash historyofwesteros, Check out our benefits and things that we have special offer for y'all, like extra episodes, access to scripts, nicknames, and shout-outs, things like that. I want to point out, too, this is a special little anniversary. Four years ago, this was the weekend that the Forsaken chapter was read in public for the first time. Ashea and I, along with Nina... And Jim McGeehan and Jeff Hartline. Radio Westeros. And Radio Westeros. This was also the first weekend we met all of those folks. Yeah. Just, I mean, I could sit here and list off a it whole bunch of other names. It was our first panel. Yeah, we did paneling there. So this was Balticon 2016. We also got to watch an episode of Game of Thrones live with people, which was really fun. Our first one of those. Yeah. So that was like 300 people. Everybody's like singing the theme song along. We saw, <laughs> that was the one where we saw Ares for yeah. the first time, by Burn the Burn them all. Yeah, that was cool. So really fun, and it's fitting that we get to have a chapter that refers to some of the Forsaken stuff, because we were dealing with Aaron right away, and of course Aaron's in the Forsaken, along with his evil brother Euron. Now speaking of the Forsaken, this is a good time in between books for us to restate our spoiler warning. Basically anything goes in Valar Reredis. We're, we're not restricting ourselves from any sources. Some of you are not fans of including TV show discussion in Valar Reredis, but we're in divergent territory here. I'm not going to say the show won't come up anymore. It is going to come up, including in this episode, but it's less and less of a guide. I don't think HBO gave us a very clear picture on how either the Iron Islands or the Doran plots will go. Maybe some things will be similar. Sam's plot line, too, for the most part, I think is going to be significantly different. Ditto Brienne. And Cersei and Jaime are going to have some pretty major differences, too, if not really major differences. So for some of us, it's a reason to love this book even more because it's less spoiled by what we've seen and there's just so much left to go. I mean, heck, Stoneheart, right? <laughs> so many things. You could just name, what did we name? We counted over 60 plot lines. Before we just stopped counting, we counted over 60 plot lines that the show didn't resolve or, or touch. and. A lot of those are going to come up here in A Feast for Crows and then the rest in A Dance with Dragons and the, the Winds of Winter spoiler chapters. So a, a little bit of an overview since we're just getting started with this book. Feast chapters are the longest by average, so we're going to do only three or four per week. They're a lot longer than others by average, but there's fewer of them in total, of course. So we'll finish by mid-August, and that puts us on track to finish A Dance with Dragons by December. And we'll just regroup then and see what's going on if the Winds of Winter is going to be out soon, then we'll adjust accordingly. And if not, well, we'll also adjust accordingly. So just stay tuned. We'll keep you up to date with our plans as we get new information. Our schedule, if you want to keep up with the schedule, the chapters are posted in our social media sites. So you can keep up that way. 
or just pay attention to what we say in each podcast with what chapters are next. This time, we'll be starting with the first three chapters, beginning with the prologue, a.k.a. the one with the fearsomely strong cider, a.k.a. Welcome Back Jockin. The prophet, the king is dead, a.k.a. the gang calls for a king's move. Or the captain of guards, the prince is dead, a.k.a. the sand snakes go directly to jail, do not pass gas. I mean, go. (laughs) I mean, please don't pass gas either. (laughs) Hey, what do we care? This is podcasting. I won't know. (laughs) I will. You won't know. Yeah, you'll know. Shay will know. For for her benefit, let's not do that. (laughs) Okay. So another funky thing about A Feast for Crows is that the style of naming of chapters has changed. And, of course, the style of POV distribution has changed, too. We get three characters right off the bat, these first three that we're doing today, that are not n- entirely new. I mean, we've heard of, well, we hadn't heard of Ario Hota, and we certainly had heard of Pate. But we, heard of, we had heard of Old Town and the Citadel, and we knew Jock and Hagar already, uh, though probably for the first time reading this chapter, we didn't necessarily know that was him. And while we have seen Aaron Dampere, we didn't exactly know a whole lot about him either. It says a lot that he's the most familiar of the three POVs going into this. It isn't until Chapter 6 that we get a familiar POV. Arya then at number 7, Sansa at 11. So it gets a little more familiar after that. But a lot of this just feels like a completely new book. One, one or two commenters mentioned that it almost seems like a new series. I recall reading... The Ironborn chapters in 2003, and you'll be saying, wait, how is that possible? Feast for Crows came out years after that. Well, it's true, but George released a thing called The Arms of the Kraken in a a magazine called Dragon Magazine, and Dragon Magazine is a fantasy publication, and it contains the five Ironborn chapters. It was, what what a treat this was for me, young Aziz, well, younger Aziz, here it is, look. Dragon Magazine, issue 305, 2003. You can see George, exclusive George R. Martin novella written across the top here. I was at work back when I had a job, and I took an extra long lunch break because I knew that magazine would be sitting there on the shelf, so I drove up to, I guess it was Barnes & Noble, got a drink, Sat there and read those five chapters, and yeah, it was a long lunch break. I, they were wondering where I went, but <laughs> I had important business to conduct in the name of Ironborn chapters. They have not changed much. You would think that maybe given that they were written three years before the book came out or two and a half years before the book came out that some things would change. Very little change. There was an error where Lady Bolton is mentioned when it's supposed to say Lady Glover, and it's really obviously supposed to be Lady Glover if you're familiar with the plot lines at all. At the time, it, would, it was a little confusing, but ultimately, it didn't matter. <laughs> so that was really neat. It contains the two Victorian chapters, the two Aaron chapters, and the one Asha chapter. And just like I was saying, it felt almost like a whole new series, except it did contain some familiar elements. And I really, really liked it. Now, that said, a complaint about A Feast for Crows when it came out was the lack of Daenerys, John, Tyrion, Bran, etc. And I'm not going to lie, when I got the book fresh off, you know, fresh off the presses in the mail, I was disappointed in that aspect too. But that was a relatively short-term disappointment. In the long term, this book has risen highly in esteem because of the very same things that people expressed disappointment in. They wanted more of what they knew. So initially there was a little bit of rejection of the new stuff. But in the long term... The new stuff was just so good, and that is what rose to the top. The cream rises, so to speak. <laughs> the divi- the, in other words, you could say the divergences from the main path became some of the best parts. I remember none other than Elio Garcia Jr. himself, the author of The World of Ice and Fire, co-author and co-founder of Westeros.org along with Linda Antonson. He was aggressively defending this book when it came out. People were, you know, he runs Westeros.org, so there was a lot of people commenting on it, and there was a lot of disappointment. Some people were calling this the worst book in the series. He not only disagreed, but said it was the best. At the time, a lot of people thought this was a ridiculous claim, that, that he was being like a uh, some sort of 
literary hipster that he was defending his favorite author and fandom over much. But the years, let me tell you, the years have proven that dude right. <laughs> he was totally correct. I mean, you don't have to agree with him that it's the best book, but you can't deny that it has risen to that level for a lot of people. It's a tortoise defeating the hare kind of situation. Fitting, given George R. R. Martin's love of turtles. <laughs> To be fair, among people who aren't as big in the reread community, people who have only read the series once, fans who are, say, unlikely to do what y'all are doing, meaning listening to a Song of Ice and Fire podcast, especially reread podcasts or reread portions of a Song of Ice and Fire podcasts. So those people who aren't into this kind of stuff, they do tend to look sideways at this notion that Feast is the best. It does to them. It really does sound like hipsterism oh you're just picking your favor you're picking the the least known book to be the coolest and best book and I, I i can't really argue with them on that because they don't you can't make them understand why feast is so good you just have to say nah you're wrong really it, people really do love it and yeah it uh, you can kind of see their point though from an outsider's perspective it's a shorter book and it doesn't have the main characters yeah but to us that's just trivia feast doesn't have to be your favorite but you are the type to listen to a podcast made not just for A Song of Ice and Fire fans, but as I said, for people rereading it. You might not love the Ironborn, you might not love the Dornish stuff as much, but you know that it's all going to be rolled into the plots of the major characters that we're not seeing now, especially Daenerys. I mean, the Ironborn and the Dornish are both going to come to her in Slaver's Bay. They, she's not even going to come to them, they're going to go to her. So now, let's get into the text itself. Let's get into specifics. Along with introducing new POVs and characters, we are seeing how they react to several world-altering events. That's partly why the five-year gap was scrapped, because these reactions were deemed too important, too much to skip over. News of Dragons, the deaths of Balin Greyjoy and Oberyn Martell, in particular for this one, Tywin Lannister is a bigger death, arguably, but news of that starts next week, when it awakens Cersei. And it isn't just the reactions of these POVs that matter. These are the kinds of deaths that everyone will care about. Dorne is really angry at the Red Viper's death from top to bottom in terms of so social structure. The, the commoners are upset. The nobility is upset. The Iron Islands are chaotic after Balon's death. And while Tywin's might be the biggest death of all, again, no one in these first three chapters learns it yet. Interestingly, the reactions in both Dorne and the Iron Islands is to keep the status quo by calling for order in a time of chaos. Yet these calls for order may actually increase the chaos. Aaron aims to keep his brother's dream of independence alive, but despite his confidence in these dreams, the king's mood is a risky maneuver, and it does indeed spectire, uh, and it does indeed backfire spectacularly, as does his rejection of the results. Meanwhile, Doran continues to bide his time despite what many see as yet another grave provocation by House Lannister against the Dornish and House Martell. So he's risking fanning the flames by imprisoning the Sand Snakes and by continuing to seemingly do nothing. Unlike Aaron, he seems to understand the risks, but in both cases, the risks are there. And let's be honest, there's going to be plenty of failure for both Aaron and Doran if we're counting, and maybe even more than we know of. Also, unlike Aaron and even our POV Ario Hota, we are aware that the powers that be are all angling to tie themselves to Daenerys in one form or another, which is part of where a lot of this failure is going to land. In the Ironborn case, it's because they want to tie Daenerys to them by forcible marriage and a dragon or three. That will be the goal of Euron and, by extension, Victorian. For Doran Martell, it will also be marriage to his son Quentin, not his marriage to his son Quentin. That's Daenerys, not... <laughs> Doran's not going to marry his own son, but without the force, of course. Quentin might not be the only one of these mentioned to wind up roasted for his troubles. He's just the only one we know of that's definitely roasted for his troubles. Both Aaron and Doran are fixated on the past while looking to the future. Aaron almost literally wants the future to be a return to the past. It's grand retrograde. As we learn later in the book, Doran does want the total destruction of Tywin Lannister and his works. He's just keeping it on the down low. Revenge for murders, foul, but quite long ago. Still, he thinks first of the children, the future personified, and Dorne as a whole. Crowning becomes important right away. They discuss kings and queens at the Quill and Tankard in the prologue, then the king's moot, 
and a plot to crown Marcella mentioned in the chapter after. All of our chapters today are by the water. Small detail there. Aaron is drowning men at the start of his. Hota shows us the water gardens, and they walk along the coast road, while, of course, the prologue, where we begin, is in Old Town. Not only the oldest city in Westeros, but a port city. So, very much associated with water, and that is super important because the trade that arrives in Old Town from all over brings with it news, and news is a big part of this chapter. So let's go there. Prologue. The one with the fearsomely strong cider, a.k.a. welcome back, Jockin. Or we could go with Dom Tartaglia's suggestion, the gang ignores the five-year gap. <laughs> like I that. love that one. That's really good. That's better than, than either of mine, really. <laughs> good job, Dom. Daenerys is too big of a figure on the world stage for word to not spread about her eventually. Even though it's spread from so far away, that word is eventually going to get to a place like Old Town. But it's the dragons themselves that have people talking even more than, than they do about her. After all, huge numbers of people have seen the dragons by now. And while I'm personally more impressed by the hatching of the dragons, not many people saw that. That's more a matter of, of rumor. Their origin is perhaps in dispute. But seeing them in person, well, that by itself does a whole lot to any witness. Yeah, it's kind of interesting for them to imagine just the idea of wow, there are dragons in the world now and how, you know, in all they would be. And then they hear the story of how they were hatched. That I feel like I'd be like, that part is BS. Yeah, there's no way they would believe that. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few of them might, but, you know. They could believe in dragons. Well, for example, uh, who is it? Uh, um, Armin is the skeptic in this group. He'd be like, no way. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? She walked into the fire? <laughs> it's like, I, I don't deny that dragons were born. But... But just come on, the comet and the eggs and the, yeah, that does not sound realistic at all. <laughs> Nina writes uh, that part of the purpose of this prologue is to take a step back from the events of the first act of A Song of Ice and Fire, to look at what has been happening from people completely removed from the action, which is cool, and that gives that feel as to why this is sort of like a new novel, because we don't know who these people are, and they not only do we not know who they are, but they've barely been involved in what we've seen so far. It's easy as readers to think about Daenerys' dragons as real living things because we've seen them repeatedly, seen what they've done, and seen people react to them. To the students of the Citadel, though, thousands of miles away, this is still just rumor. Even though the rumors are compelling, they haven't actually gotten that look, that last bit of proof that seals the deal that you can no longer deny. It's like, okay, I've seen them. That is as real as it gets. Likewise, when Pate thinks about the conflict between Tywin and Stannis, I mean, he can't know that Tywin's already dead and Stannis is at the wall. So there's some, they, they're ahead of the curve on some news and behind on others. This prologue is also a bit of anomaly, Joe writes, in that while it keeps up with the code of prologues being related to something magical, it does it in a more subtle and unexpected way. There's a lot of magic in this chapter, but it's really an undercurrent. And that's kind of a trick because the Citadel is so anti-magic. Yet even the Citadel has some magical elements to it, like, well, not just in its history, but the glass candles. But Old Town is very relatable as a setting compared to a lot of other places around Westeros. I mean, not many of us have been knights or ruled any, a fiefdom or had a lordship, but being a student, going to university perhaps, or at least living around a university, uh, or, you know, the age of these characters, they're mostly in their young 20s or late teens, which most of us have either been or are. And about a, the basic of the POV here, it's a guy who wants a girl, right? It's very straightforward in terms of the, the character himself who we're seeing this through. He's a very normal person. He's not a murderous, uh, problematic dude like Chet, even though Chet's also a commoner. He's not an old man seeing great change in dark gods and worship like Cresson, who does get mentioned in this chapter. <laughs> Nor is he about to be killed by the others like Waymar Royce. Oh, wait, he is about to be killed by a faceless man. That's pretty close. <laughs> death is death. You're not going to quibble over your own death, right? He's like, oh, at least I wasn't killed by... Eh, you're killed. Whatever. But behind all this, this chat about dragons... This hidden faceless man action, talking about the Citadel and the glass candles, 
it's really neat how George balances this very mundane conversation with these very mostly mundane characters with these very not mundane topics of which they don't know the full extent of. So we're witness to some of the earliest conversations where the rumors are strong and persistent enough that it reaches a tipping point and the rumors start to become so powerful that people start to see them as truth. And we know that at least in this case, they're right to believe that dragons are in the world again. And fitting to this, that we start the book, the entire book, with this line. Dragons, said Molander. Right, and it's a testament to Varys' skills as well. I mean, Varys can't stop the news from reaching all the different port cities around the world. That's, that's ridiculous. But what he did was muddy the waters on these rumors in advance so that they would seem like rumors. He, he dresses them up, kind of like what we were discussing. Make the story sound even more outlandish. People are less likely to believe it, especially people like Tywin Lannister who tries to keep things rational and unfanciful, even though, in this case, the fanciful is completely real. So the nobility are slow when it comes to Daenerys because Varys has given them some advanced propaganda to keep them occupied elsewhere. They hear these rumors, and they've already heard them through, through Varys and have already pre-dismissed them. So when the rumors come again, they're already going to be predisposed to say, eh, I don't care about that. I've got bigger problems than to listen to rumors from Slaver's Bay. Like, why would they, you know, it's easy, you can, it's, it's easy to see, see why Varus got this to work. There's a lot of reasons why they would be driven to not care. I mean, Tywin never took the dragon seriously. Melisandre has Stannis and others looking in the wrong place for them. And most other places aren't talking about dragons at all. Although, <laughs> we are dealing with the few places that are talking about them or will. For example, the Ironborn. Of all places, they're going to be an exception to not talking about dragons when Euron introduces them at the King's Moot. And Doran Martell, at the end of this book, with his vengeance, fire, and blood talk to Arianne, we're going to see, oh, you're aware of some of this stuff too. So this all circles back to what I was saying in the beginning, how the Dornish and Ironborn plots are individual but also, they set up Daenerys. So the lack of Daenerys is replaced with set up for Daenerys. And to be fair about Old Town, it's no ordinary place. Even great lords don't have access to news that the locals of Old Town do, of some kind, right? People come from all over the world. I just find it hard to believe that even though a man like Hoster Tully, or Edmure, let's say Edmure Tully, who's actually alive, could learn about... Slaver's Bay sooner than the regular folk of Old Town, just because ships aren't pulling up to River Run <laughs> with, you know, from Slaver's Bay every single day, like they do in Old Town. There's ships coming from all over the world, many of which have heard these rumors. But River Run, in the middle of the continent, it's hearing all sorts of news from all around from the other nobles and what's going on in the north and the south. But as terms of news from overseas, they're isolated. So it's important to kind of at least grasp the concept of the, the way news travels and to where these vectors are. Some of you have heard us do a whole episode on this chapter. We made a members only, a patrons episode on it several years ago. Of course, that was before both Fire and Blood and the end of the show. So a few things look a little different, but other things are similar. And still there's things left to cover. We're not going to, for example, fully cover Old Town even between that episode and this one. I mean, that's a huge, tall order. And... This is a big enough chapter, really, that a lot could be said about it without too much overlap on what we said in that prior scripted version. So you want more on this chapter, though, definitely check that out. We go into a lot of detail on some things like, say, our analysis of George R. R. Martin's take on this chapter. He did eight episodes of his own podcast back in 2006. That's it. He just did eight episodes of a podcast. OG podcast. Yeah, man. like oh, 2006, man. <laughs> and one of the episodes of those eight was all about this chapter. One of the things he talks about is writing multiple POVs before picking Pates. Like, he even tried writing it from Rosie's point of view. He tried Molander's point of view. I think he even tried Armin's point of view. Anyway, we go into a lot of that detail in that episode. But one consistent portion of the different POV versions he wrote for this chapter was that it seemed important to set up this location of Old Town. Let's talk about that a little bit. And it's... 
interestingly set up as a comparison in a lot of ways to King's Landing, because that's the biggest city we've had experience with. So a lot of this is framed um, with that in mind. Here's the quote. Pate had never seen King's Landing, but he knew it was a daub and wattle city, a sprawl of mud streets, thatched roofs, and wooden hovels. Old Town was built in stone, and all its streets were cobbled down to the meanest alley. That's a really big difference. I mean... Yeah, down to the alleys? Yeah, like it's a really well-made city. It's far more developed than King's Landing. Far, far more developed. Much nicer from the way it looks to the way it smells. (laughs) Uh, There's just a greater... uh, There's less poverty in Old Town, it seems. And the infrastructure is superior in Old Town, even though it's older uh, in a lot of ways. Now, that's not true universally. There's certain aspects of King's Landing that are probably better developed, newer in a good way. But Westeros is not a place where it's a straight line up in terms of technology. We all know that technology is kind of a iffy subject in general there. But the place where knowledge is most collected is here in Old Town, and that's not just going to include things like dragon lore and stuff on dragon glass or histories of different nations. It's going to include logistical knowledge. It's going to include just basic how-to-do stuff, things like how to build buildings, how to build cobblestone streets, how to create the mixtures that uh, lead to the, the substances that you build from. All these various things are contained in the Citadel as well. And that's really important and really sad. Because if you're like me, you have this cynical expectation, maybe not even cynical, it might be realistic, expectation that it's all going to burn or be destroyed. And this is where we get into a little bit of the TV show talk. Just a little bit, though. In the show, Bran is supposedly a target of the Night King because he's this vast store of human knowledge. Well, that was a a little awkward. Because he is, yes, but people can't really access it. He's not out there writing down everything he knows. But So I think the show may have substituted that concept from Old Town. Because that is where... Old Town is where the vast majority of human knowledge is stored. And unlike... A person, even though even a special person like Bran, it's a lot safer <laughs> to have written down than to have in some dude's head. <laughs> that, I don't think, requires much explanation. So, something to keep an eye out for. That's one a big topic we're keeping our eyes open for, trying to set up, trying to divert your attention to or draw your attention to all the evidence that Euron is coming for Old Town and what he's going to do with it. The fact that he's coming for it is is an easy sell. What he's going to do with it, well, that's something we'll be talking about on and off throughout the book and the next book because we don't exactly know. We have great guesses. At least I think they're great guesses, but they may turn out to be kind of off or a lot off. So we'll just have to treat each, each one individually, and you all can weigh in with your own feedback on what you think of them. Nina says, I wonder if Pate's comparison between King's Landing and Old Town meaning the description of thatched roofs and wooden hovels versus the building in stone is a hint to the fates of each city. King's Landing with all that wood burning, yeah, that is perhaps minor foreshadowing for that, or at least at least describing the type of fate it could have. So Old Town would be harder to burn, but a magical disaster of some type or just the ironborn getting in and sacking it. It doesn't have to be totally magical, it just... A regular invasion done well with good strategy, tricker, tricky leadership, the kind of things Euron seems to be very capable of. We'll have to see. Now, old Town is so old that it predates the first men, possibly, perha- perhaps entirely. And that's almost unfathomably old for a city in a place where, well, what else was happening in that time? Where are all the other old places? It's hard to say. And part of the deal with this city being so old is the Blackstone Foundation of the High Tower. The Blackstone Foundation, the oily Blackstone, is a big topic in the fandom. We talk about it in our Great Empire of the Dawn episode with LML and in other places as well. The Strange Stone is a super interesting, probably Lovecraft-influenced uh, piece of history 
that, and lore that we love to play with. F for here, we will only use it as a marker to indicate the age of the place. The Blackstone, wherever it came from, whatever it is, it's old. Really, really old. And it's the same type of stone found in the sea stone chair. So it's a very, very subtle connection between these early locations, this black stone, which isn't even mentioned in that same way in the Ironborn, uh, in Aaron's chapter. It's mentioned that the sea stone chair is made out of that stone, but not in his chapter. So it's super sneaky, the connection between these ancient locations. We might have, we might be dealing with some of the oldest places where of human habitation in Westeros, or non-humans perhaps. And that's something that applies to the Ironborn as well. We'll get into a little more when we, when we get to Aaron's chapter, but the origin, their origins may not be entirely human either, and it ties to the same very, very same black stone. And that is also fitting, or at least a segue, into another major feature of Old Town, which is its wide variety of temples and churches and places of worship. This is not uncommon for ports, because ports like to be accommodating to people all over the world because they know that people all over the world are going to be there. You go to an international airport and you will find cross-faith worship places. Like you go to an airport and you might in America and you can find a place to worship almost no matter what religion you are. But, you know, and that's true in a, lot of, in, in a lot of countries around the world. A lot of airports have features like that. So it's kind of a similar concept. But here it's neat to see because it's more diverse we, have, we don't get a great look at the temples and churches at King's Landing. Surely there's diversity there. But it's a very, very faith of the seven dominated city. And so is Old Town. But clearly they've got this tolerance and this diversity that's built up over a much longer time. Again, the age of the city affects everything we talk about with it. it the, all these things have been in place much longer the status quo in Old Town is such a different thing than the status quo in King's Landing. This chapter, like the Storm of Swords prologue, feeds right into Sam's POV. Fitting then that the fearsomely strong cider mentioned in this one is also mentioned by Eamon a bit later. What's the deal with this fearsomely strong cider? Why did I make it part of the title? Well, of course, it's a thing that they're drinking throughout this chapter. But it's mentioned by other characters, that's why. And, and, and as I just said, Maester Eamon himself mentions it. He's, he's looking forward to trying the cider again, one of the many things that makes us sad about Eamon because he doesn't get to. It's mentioned that Egg, meaning his brother Egg, and Duncan the Tall have been there and had it with him. So there's a lot of history around this inn. It's a little island on the Honeywine River. And the, there's some... Probably negative foreshadowing here where it's it's listed as having stood for 600 years and it'll probably stand for 600 more. That kind of line to a first time reader or casual reader means nothing. It's like, oh, yeah, OK, that's just general optimism for this place being, yeah, 600 years. Yeah, it'll stand. We know better. It doesn't definitely mean the place is going to die, <laughs> be burned or destroyed by the Ironborn or or something brought by the Ironborn, something awful and unthinkable. But it, when it says it'll probably stand for 600 more, you, got, you all know, you're all too savvy with A Song of Ice and Fire at this point. Whether you were before Valar Reredus or because of Valar Reredus, you know that that kind of line is a giveaway. <laughs> Watch out, Quill and Tankard. These are some of the last tankards we'll ever see drank there, I suppose. But this is months and months before Sam even gets there. Let's keep that in mind, too. The, the name Quill and Tanker is a really cool place. I just like that name. Joe Buckley says the same thing. He says it's a wonderful setting for a drink. Uh, Joe notices the same thing. He mentions the, the, unfortunately, Pate mentions how long it's been open, which is always a sure mark that something isn't going to be around that much longer. <laughs> yep, so it's, it's, it's almost like, a language that only a Song of Ice and Fire people speak. You see something predicted, you know to think, guess the opposite, <laughs> depending on the way it's said. Yeah, that's a death sentence. So let's check out these characters. A lot of interesting characters here. Some of them are probably don't have a future in the story, but it's still an interesting breakdown to see how George constructed the scene and the different personalities he put in to have them ask different questions, to weigh in on what's said. For example, the character Rune is the youngest one there. He's asking questions 
And that's that's great. We need someone to be asking questions, the basic questions, like what's this? Who is this guy? Who is that guy? Why? What's the history of this? What's that? And if you had a bunch of nobility sitting around or older experienced folk, these, some of these conversations wouldn't make sense. They wouldn't be organic. Uh, Pate, first of all, follows the usual pattern of epilogue prologue characters dying. Uh, sorry, dude. He wasn't exactly a lucky man before this, but talk about hapless. Getting singled out by a faceless man because that faceless man wants to take your place and infiltrate your work. That's bad luck, y'all. That is bad luck. <laughs> like, you talk about reverse winning the lottery. And, and it's tough on how it's delivered to him, too. I mean, the alchemist is, isn't very nice. <laughs> I mean, shocking that a death cult worshiping assassin is not a nice man. But the choosing, forcing him to choose between being a thief or a failure, that's kind of how it's delivered to Pate. He's like, well, are you a thief or. The unspoken is, or are you a failure? And Pate really wants to succeed. He really wants to... I mean, he's focused on Rosie, obviously. This is, there's all these amazing conversations happening all around him. There's Alaris is putting on an archery clinic. They're talking about dragons and, and all sorts of other fancy stuff, and he's just thinking about Rosie. <laughs> it's all he's, he's like, yeah, dragons are cool, but Rosie, she's even better. And... I mean, even when he's dying, his last thought is of Rosie. That is how locked in he is on this girl. So I guess that explains why it's so easy for him to be fooled, because he's so locked in, so narrow-minded, focused, that the alchemist is like, boy, this is going to be really, really easy. And the part of the reason here, we'll get into a little more about Jake and uh, Jockin as we get through these characters here, but... Let's talk briefly about the things Pate finds in the locker when he's getting the key for the alchemist. There's a lock of hair in there. The lock of hair is probably from a lover, not a family member, because yeah, it's usually, you don't usually carry locks of your family member's hair around. I don't know. Maybe you would. Maybe that's just, it's just a different time and place. But to me, that seems like maybe someone he used to have feelings for that he had to give up on because he became a maester. But it's not anyone we can really track down with any sort of uh, certainty. The portrait, same thing. Um, we can't. It might be the same person, but this looks more like the portrait. Is someone that kind of looks like him. So this does look like a relative, which means it's probably not the same person with the lock of hair. If the theory about it being a lover is true. Ultimately, I don't think there's much to say about the portrait of the Lock of Hair. The gauntlet's a little bit more interesting. This is one we go much more thoroughly into in the Vala, in the uh, Patrons Only episode for the, this Pate prologue. But I'll jump ahead to the conclusion. I think it's the gauntlet of Oberyn Martell himself. He studied at the Citadel. Uh, he is a prince. It says it's the gauntlet of a prince, not a lord, not a king. And, of course, like I said, he studied there. It would be a little extra nod to Sorella Sand, who we're going to talk about in a minute. And uh, the timeline fits. It could be like Rhaegar, you know, Rhaegar is a possibility. You want to go back farther in time, it could be Aemon or Egg. The problem with Aemon is, I mean, Aemon joined the Citadel when he was young, before he would have been training. So how having a gauntlet doesn't necessarily make sense. Anyway, I don't think that's a super important story either, but it's good to know and keep track of because it's one of those things that maybe it will become important. We might not realize why it's important until... Uh, more details are revealed to us later. It's a chapter focusing so much on the supernatural, like I said, so the, it's really fitting how unfocused on that the, our POV is. Nina notes that there's at least 17 other pates mentioned in Westeros right now, it's, which is probably George intentionally picking the most common name he can. His background is barely discussed. Wait. What would you call like a group of pates? <laughs> a pate of pates? Like people in the chat, I just want to hear your ideas for a group of pates. <laughs> I, I want to of as pates? well. <laughs> I don't know. I, I want those shared with me, please. <laughs> take good, take good notes on the pate uh, answers here, please. <laughs> so yeah, Nina notes that we hardly get into his backstory at all. It's not terribly important. Even Chet gets more backstory. Where is he from? The Westerlands? But that's it. Like, where in the Westerlands? It's pretty vague. He doesn't have much talent. I mean, we do see that he's not terribly skilled. He's tried, but failed. 
and landing as a caretaker for a, a senile man is is mm, it's not what he had in mind. And his future is not very bright because, well, after Maester Walgrave passes, well, what job are they going to give him next? Given this is what they thought him fit for, he doesn't have a lot to look forward to. So again, it explains in part why he's so focused on Rosie because very little else in his life has promise. And she kind of does. Now, he is selfish a bit about this, but he's not like malicious. He's not brutal, right? He doesn't seem to hate anyone at the Citadel besides Leo, and Leo's easy to hate, and you can see why he hates Leo. Leo's a jerk to him. Um, he's in a number of ways. And he doesn't even really think about the alchemist. I mean, he's curious. He's like, let me see your face. He's, he, he asks what the key is for, but then when he says, I'm not going to tell you, Pate's like, okay, whatever. I don't really care. So he, he's not like super curious either. There's a, a bit of a nod, bit of an in-joke here. Right before he meets up with the alchemist, Pate sees piglets go by him, squealing in distress. It's, it's a two-fold joke. Pate had once played with Rosie's Toes, the whole little piggy game. You know, this little piggy went to market. That's kind of a nod to that, that scene. Made her laugh. But these piglets are, are screaming. He'll never be with Rosie again. Uh, they're running away from a place where he's going to die. Pate was also named for Spotted Pate the Pig Boy who always triumphed in the stories over higher-up people. These are, of course, stories. In this story about stories, Pate is, does, doesn't have a happy ending for his. There's no triumphing over greater, his, his betters in this case. There is powers that go far beyond his comprehension, killing him for their own ends and thinking very little of it, most likely. There's some peculiarity here, though, with Rosie. I wonder about this. In a vacuum, her life seems kind of problematic because she's being raised to be a sex worker on, against her own will. But she doesn't seem unhappy. But we don't really get a close look at her. She's like maybe like a lot of women in, in a service industry. She's putting on a brave, happy face to please her customers. We don't really know. And of course, our POV is extremely biased about the whole thing. So it's hard to be sure. But what's interesting then on top of that, since we can't really get at her personality, is some of the things she does here. And, hmm, I wonder if, if Rosie doesn't know more than we think. I'm not trying to get super conspiratorial here or tinfoily, but Shay talks about how women in her profession become really good at identifying what's really going on with a person's identity. Remember, she just totally recognizes Varus when he's in one of his best disguises, and even Varus is surprised at that. Again, Shay's got experience as a sex worker, though, and Rosie does not. Still, she's in a service industry that is fraught with men, you know, grabbing her and just making unwanted passes at her. So maybe she understood something was up with this alchemist. Not that she figured out he was a faceless man, but she may have understood something was going on here. Likewise, the same goes for Alaris who is almost certainly Sorella Sand, meaning Oberyn's daughter. Pate notices that Rosie li kind of likes Alaris and even touches him sometimes. That makes him a little bit jealous. It's possible that the reason that Rosie is drawn to Alaris is because he's actually a man. But it might also be because he, he's not... He's different in that he's not trying to grab her all the time and flirt with her. He's actually respectful. And, of course, that's because he's not really a he and is probably not into girls. He might be. She might, you know, Sorella might be into girls, but she's at least being respectful or isn't into Rosie. <laughs> so that is an interesting uh, angle to what's going on with Rosie. But the most important thing is she talking about the alchemist she's the one who introduced the alchemist to Pate in the first place. So what's that all about? Did the alchemist approach Rosie because he knew that Pate was into her? He saw Pate, like, staring at her, and it wasn't too hard to figure out what that stare meant. And so he sought to sub take advantage of this. It's interesting. I don't know. She knows of the meeting, though. She might know that Pate disappeared, but she probably can't because Pate's still Pate. He's just... The Alchemist. 
If Pate's behaving oddly, not like he used to, maybe Rosie would notice that. I don't know. If she's really observant, that's the kind of thing she might take, uh, take note of. If she ever meets Sam, that's something to look out for. If Rosie and Sam ever come into contact, I wonder if, the, if this will come up at all. Sam has certainly met the alchemist in Pate's uh, and disguised as Pate at the end of the book. So, yeah, I, don't look past Rosie. She's a little interesting character here, and there might be a little more to her. But just as easily, we may never see her again. Mollander. This is the club-footed big dude who could have been a knight, if not for his club foot, and is looking like he's either now or soon to be an alcoholic. He's was already of some of a, a bit of a drinker, but he drinks even more after his father died on the Blackwater. Mollander also hates Leo Tyrell. And again, Leo Tyrell's easy to hate, but if we want to dig a little deeper, maybe Mollander's father fought for Stannis and thus was killed by Tyrell forces. But it's really hard to say why a bitter person is bitter when they have so much to be bitter over. I mean, it doesn't sound like Mollander's life has been so great. But also, building on this idea, Nina points out that Mollander tows Daenerys. And I wonder if part of that is the anger at the fact that his father died in the Blackwater. That might also be connected. For all we know, Mollander's father was on the same side as the Tyrells. We have no idea. But either way, there's a chance his resentment is aimed at the men who were in charge of those armies and who led the war effort that got his father killed. So you wonder, too, if this sentiment, this, hey, at least Daenerys isn't one of those guys. Like, all the options in the Seven Kingdoms are crappy. Like, none of the kings are worth supporting. Hey, hey, who's Varys supporting? Varys gets mentioned in this chapter, but on first read, nobody has any idea that Varys is supporting his own candidate, his own Aegon. And if that guy shows up, Molander is a perfect example of the type of attitude that Aegon's candidacy might capitalize on, meaning, hey, I'm this young, uncorrupted, unconnected to these families who have been bitterly fighting over and over. I'm going to come save the realm. I'm the man. <laughs> and I'm the son of Rhaegar and all that. So there's going to be a lot about him that sounds great. So someone like Molander would be like, you could see him raising a toast to Aegon with even more enthusiasm than he did to Daenerys. And, of course, that says a lot about how Daenerys will be received in the long run and how she will struggle to be seen as in the same light as maybe someone like Young Griff slash Fagon will be. Molander also makes in another uh, small but very important declaration. Old Town is not the world, declared Molander too loudly. This is a sneaky... <coughs> Pardons. This is a sneakily important line. Despite the major news of dragons lacking elsewhere, here in Old Town, it's not just Tywin's death they haven't learned of. They haven't even heard of Oberyn's death, though those two happened within a few days of each other, so they'll probably hear about them at the same time. They also don't seem to know Stannis is at the wall. So, yeah, even though Old Town is a hub of news, there's still a lot going on they don't hear about, and it's just a big wide world just besides that. They don't, uh, academics, that's a, a common complaint about people, you know, they ever heard the term ivory tower academics. I think it gets thrown around a little too much, but it's a real concept. It's the idea of someone who's has their head too buried in books to process the real world. And you see that a little bit with the character Armin, who we're going to talk about next. So maybe this is George talking about these academics being a little too academic and not as sophisticated as they seem and maybe needing to pay more attention to what's really going on out in the world and really talking to people who know what's, what's, what's going on and not just burying your head in books. And we do see that in the TV show, by the way, we do see, you know, Sam tries to get the archmaster's like, guys, you guys are just sitting here and talking, like do something. And maybe that's a little bit of the same type of talk here. So yeah, Armin the Acolyte, he's an Acolyte with four links, so he's on his way. He seems smart, uh, like he's academically gifted, perhaps. 
But this is exactly what I was saying. He's a doubter. He's knowledgeable, but he's an unimaginative skeptic, which in the real world, that's one thing. But in a world that absolutely definitively, provably has or did have magic, you you can only take skepticism so far, I think. And I'm a skeptic personally, so this is it's almost hard for me to say that. <laughs> so out of all the characters in this scene, Armin's the most like a, a maester himself, I suppose you could say. Because he's, he's on that track and he speaks like a maester, even if he hasn't fully ascended to that level. He doubts the dragons because he says, all the stories of dragons are different. And I forget which one of them it is, maybe Molander, who says, yeah, but there's a dragon. The, all the stories talk about dragons. You can't deny that common element to them all. Armin isn't necessarily sold, but we have the gift of, of knowing which one of them is right. So I, I wonder, Armin, I think, is probably unimportant going forward. But what he represents is very, very important. He is a voice of the Citadel without maybe realizing that's what he's doing. He's kind of representing the, the, uh, the voice of, of skeptical academics here in a time when skepticism needs to be set aside. As we're going to see, we've got a couple quotes a little later in this episode to talk about the, the age we're entering now and how mm, it's a time to be believing in magic, not to be rejecting it. Speaking of, Lazy Leo, hateful guy. You don't like him. He's easy to dislike. He's arrogant. He's rude. He's cruel. He talks down to people. I already called him arrogant. Same thing, being arrogant, talking down to people, really. Easy to dislike is the point. But, interesting nonetheless, he goes against this image of Tyrell's we've seen so far, kind of, in that he's somewhat learned. He's actually a believer in these dark tales. He listens to Marwin and repeats some of what Marwin says and says, yeah, it's a time for wonders and, and, and gods and monsters and stuff like that. So that's just an interesting mix of personality traits. He's perhaps the most open-minded of the group besides Alaris, who's also very open-minded about magic and stuff, despite being one of the ones that or probably the one that we like the least out of the group. I mean, you know, your mileage may vary. Also, he's a little different looking. He's got ash blonde hair, which all the Tyrells of Highgarden we've seen so far have that brown hair. Um, obviously, not counting some of the family members who have married into the family, mothers and such. But still, that's interesting. Very far down the line he is, though. This is, this is talk about the end of the Tyrell line. He's the youngest child of a youngest child. His father, Morin is youngest brother to Mace Tyrell, and Mace had four brothers. So, yeah, he's a little bit like uh, egg on the unlikely. It would be, you know, it'd be funny if Lazy Leo became Lord of Highgarden because he's the last of the last. <laughs> it would mean like all these Tyrells were wiped out. Uh, that would be funny. Hmm. Nonetheless, his father, despite being so far down the line in the Tyrells, they're such a powerful family that M Morin Tyrell has... A powerful position. He's the commander of the City Watch in Old Town, which maybe isn't the best job to have right now because of the oncoming onslaught of, of Ironborn that we expect. So I wouldn't bet on Morin Tyrell sticking around till the end of the series. Um, what that will mean for Leo, I don't know. Maybe Leo will get involved in the fighting too. Uh, he's apparently very capable with the sword, so he could actually redeem himself a little bit by helping defend the city. But there's just so many possibilities for what could happen to these characters that we don't want to go too far down that the guess, guessing game road when we have so much less to cover left to cover. Let's talk about Alaris. It's pretty well known in the fandom by this point that Alaris is Sorella Sand. In a chapter featuring a faceless man killing our POV character, going from disguise to impersonation, it's kind of funny that we have a second character pretending to be someone else. This one has a sense of humor and perhaps some cynicism in other people's ability to look at names backwards. Because this is not the sneakiest disguise. You're just turning your name around and be like, hey, if I showed up with different clothes and was like, Aziz isn't available today, but his twin brother Aziza is here. No relation. <laughs> it's this twin brother, but the name has nothing to do with it. <laughs> but, you know, this is a not very literate society, even though we're at the Citadel. <laughs> <laughs> where just no one's noticed that Alaris backwards is Sorella. But why would they look for such a thing? Like, did you check did you did you check to see what her name backwards and forwards is? All right, okay. He cleared that. All right, she's okay. 
I mean, he. <laughs> he in disguise, she in reality. So let's run through the evidence for just in case uh, you're not fully convinced or just to get the evidence straight. You may have missed some of the evidence for why Sorella is, is Alaris and vice versa. Sorella is the fourth daughter of Oberyn Martell and a uh, woman from the Summer Islands. Um, and that is what's said about, uh, about Alaris as well, that it's a Dornish father and a Summer Islander traitor. And in fact, it's a traitor from the Iron Isle, from the Summer Islands that Oberyn really did have Sorella with. So even that detail is, is the same. Alaris is described as comely, slight, and slim, which kind of indicates that, uh, hints at, you know, not being a man. Obviously, men can be those things, but it's certainly a clue. Alaris has the widow's peak of black curls and, and black eyes, and it's exactly like Oberyn has, and many of Oberyn's children have that exact same widow's peak. Alaris speaks in a soft Dornish drawl, suggesting growing up in Dorne, living there. Very skilled with the Summer Islands bow, which is pretty fitting with the weapons training Oberyn gave all his daughters. Oberyn himself studied at the Citadel, so following in her, his, her father's footsteps. And, in fact, they're gathered today. The celebration that they're having is because Alaris got her copper link. Doran Martell is going to mention that Sorella is not in Dorne and advises Arya Hota to, quote, leave her to her game, which fits with Sorella disguising herself as a man to study at the Citadel. Sorella has not only been interested in learning asking Oberyn about people who lived at the Desert Holdfast, things like that. There's, this, there's a memory that Arianne has about Sorella asking questions and being inquisitive, which, you know, builds to this interest in, in learning more, going to university to go on a bigger quest for knowledge. But according to Arianne, Sorella was forever pushing in where she didn't belong, and that's certainly happening now with trying to join an all-male organization. <laughs> and now, obviously, our own real-world sensibilities reject the idea of her not belonging there, but, you know, that's just a turn of phrase. She's not allowed there by rule, not by morals. <clears throat> Great catch by Laura Brandos, one of our lovely Facebook mods and a friend besides. She quotes, A yard-long shaft of golden wood piercing a red apple conjures the sigil of House Martell in her mind. Very good catch. Yeah, the sun transfixed by a sphere. Red apple standing Shut up, up the about the sun. <laughs> Shut up about the sun, Aziz. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. Aziz probably just destroyed your ears. It's laugh. <laughs> I really got him. Oh, a few of you guys. I hope, some, I hope at least some of you got that joke. That's from The Office. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shut up about the sun. <laughs> Whew. All right, catching my breath there. Whew. It's like I'm choking on a, a red apple. <laughs> so one story, one dark turn here is that in the North, they tell the story of brave Danny Flint, a girl who pretends to be a boy to join the Night's Watch. Her end was not good. She was brutally raped and murdered. I kind of doubt the maesters would do that. They're not like a pack of murdering thieves and, and criminals like a lot of the Night's Watch is, nor are they even warriors like the rest of the Night's Watch is. So I kind of don't think that would happen, but I don't know of any women pretending to be Night's Watch, but we do have a woman pretending to be a maester. So maybe? I don't know. But I do have a prediction for her death that I didn't have before. And, well, again, this slightly touches on the TV show. Sand Snakes, you're on. I don't know about that happening, anything like how it happened in the show. But the idea that Euron kills a Sand Snake or two, well, if Euron captures Old Town and Sorella's there, eh, that could be her fate. I hope not, but... Once I considered that option, it wasn't one I could just dismiss and say, nah, that won't happen. It might happen. I love the conversation they all have about Daenerys and Viserys and, and how it, it's another clue that Alaris is Sorella because Alaris is the one who knows the story. He, he's, he, she is the one connecting 
uh, or correcting them on their mistakes and telling the real story, which we know is the real story because we know the real story. She points out that not all the Targaryens are dead, that the beggar king had a sister. Alaris sarcastically refers to the, quote, line of Lannister's brave men murdering the infant Aegon Targaryen, which fits with the strongly anti-Lannister stance of the other adult sand snakes, right? They all really hate the Lannisters. Alaris would too. And of course, why not? It's not, it's, this is their cousin. Baby Aegon, that little boy was her cousin. Oberyn was that boy's uncle. So, again, we wonder how someone like Molander will react to young Griff showing up overseas. How is Sorella and Obara and Tyene and Nymeria and little Elia, how are they going to react to young Griff? That's the big, quick question that's only begun to be touched on in Arianne's sample Winds of Winter chapters. We haven't seen the Sand Snake's reaction to that at all. I'm very curious. <clears throat> she also makes, there's also another reference, perhaps, to her very, very distant Targaryen blood. Check out this little quote. Oh. Sorry. It's bed for me as well. I expect I'll dream of dragons and glass candles. Well, she says the glass candles because they were just talking about it, and they were just talking about dragons too, but... So it's kind of a confusing phrase. It might just be a, a throwaway line. But the fact that the Sand Snakes have some very distant Targaryen blood, and we've got examples of people with very, very distant Targaryen blood having dragon dreams. In fact... We get one in an Ariane chapter from the Winds of Winter with uh, that Tolland girl who, whose Targaryen blood cannot be recent. Probably as distant as Alaris is, is and is small in amount. So it's definitely within the realm of possibility. So I wonder about that. Also, I, got a, I love this little semi-joke that I came up with. Alaris is like the black sheep of the family, not just because she's different than her sisters in temperament and literal skin color, she's actually black, but Marwyn calls the maesters sheep. So she's a black sheep in that sense, and she's actually training to be one. So let's actually talk about Marwyn for a second. We'll have more time to talk about Marwyn. He doesn't actually appear yet. We'll spend more time on him when he does. But it's the third time he's mentioned. Interesting, right? We, we, the Miri Mazdur one is one that's risen in prominence because it's so early on and it's mentioned alongside Daenerys and right before the dragons are born. It's, it, it ties into this in, incredible grand blood magic thing that happens with the hatching of the eggs and the dancing of shadows and Drogo's semi... I don't even know what to call that. Not resurrection, but strange second life, whatever you want to call it. The other mention is Kyburn. Kyburn mentions Marwyn when talking to Jamie, I believe it is. Nina suggests that Marwyn is going to reach Daenerys and help teach her more about dragons and the supernatural and encourage her to use her dragons to take Westeros. That last part, I'm less sure about, but I could see it being true for sure. The first part about her reaching Daenerys, I think probably. However... Quaith's list of people that will reach Daenerys does not include a reference to Marwyn fitting terribly well. There isn't really one of the examples that fits. Um, so there's a chance that even though we see him at the end of the book take ship to get to Daenerys, maybe George has decided to just write him out. I hope not. I mean, Marwyn is really cool. That would stink to just have him die like that. But I can't help but notice that when Quaith rattles off all the name, you know, a uh, the sun, sun, kraken, dark flame, all those things. None of those really fit Marwyn. Dark flame is Makoro. You know, kraken is Victorian, probably. Sun, sun is Quentin. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but none of them really work for Marwyn. So, hmm, that's a, that's a toughie. Marwyn's also going to tell Alaris that he saw Sam coming, and Alaris is going to meet Sam first and say, yeah, Alaris, or say, Marwyn saw you coming through the glass candle. Knew he, he knew you were coming, and Sam's going to be like, what? <laughs> Excuse me? But it won't freak him out too much because, hey, he's already seen the others, and a, can a, gla a glass candle is not nearly as creepy as an other. And that is really neat, too, this whole concept of glass candles and Marwyn the mage at a place that's very anti-magic 
And as Marwin will tell us, well, part of that's by design. It's not just that they're anti-magic in belief. It's that they're anti-magic in execution. They are intentionally, perhaps, trying to make the world less magical by manipulation, maybe murder, maybe... I don't know exactly what their methods are. The Grand Maester Conspiracy is something that gets talked about in the fandom. I think it's a little overstated, but definitely there's something to it. And they have this, this strongly anti-magic stance is very present in this prologue. The, but again, even the founding of the Citadel stands against that. Not just the world events happening all around and some of the items and people that are there, but the foundations of the place. We mentioned earlier the Blackstone Foundation. But check this out. The, fa- this, the Citadel was traditionally associated with Prince Paramore, son of Uthor of the Hightower, who thought among other who brought among others wizards, alchemists, and sorcerers to teach him. The World of Ice and Fire also notes that before the Doom of Valyria, Maesters and Archmaesters off traveled to the Freehold to study. And Valyria was deep in sorcery and rooted in magic. So this anti-magic aspect to the Citadel isn't something that's been in place since their founding. It's probably, historically speaking, a more recent change. It might be something, a product of as recent as the dragons dying out 150 years ago, that it all started around then. Or that it started because of the danger of the dragons. The the damage done during the dance may have led some of the maesters to say, look, if we can get rid of the rest of the dragons, something like that will never happen again. And then when that happened, the magic started to die off with it, maybe, or at least tampered down, and they just went with that. It kind of followed along their path. Maybe it was an unexpected result. Or maybe they knew that by reducing the number of dragons in the world, it would also reduce magic in the world. These are the kind of things we really want to know about the Citadel and the Archmaesters and that we're really looking forward to from Sam's point of view. And... These are things that are talked about in Sam's final chapter, even before we get more Sam chapters in the next book. It could be a huge help in terms of accelerating the plot forward, in terms of communication, meaning like the glass candles. Glass candles could be a big part of the story for much simpler reasons than uh, their supernatural stuff. Maybe just the communication of talking far to, uh, one place to another could, could be a big deal just by itself. I mean, that's really powerful. Improved communication, right? Communicating with the wall, things like that. Who knows exactly what, but it, that's, that would be a major technological advancement, even if only a few people could use it. Uh, the, the colors of the candles are notably black and green, uh, most prominently. There's occasionally other colors, too, apparently, but how can you not notice whenever it's, whenever it's something specifically black and green, those are the two opposing colors, you've you got to think of the Dance of the Dragons. And, and the Dance of the Dragons, conceptually, has been popping up in and out of this chapter with the talk of Daenerys... And, and young Griff, and how people are going to react to them both, and how they're going to react to each other, and how dragons and maesters all interact. There's just so much. It's like a big pot of stew all mixed together. <laughs> and it's so strange, too, that despite the anti-magic bias, they use this glass candle as part of their initiation. But this is probably a throwback to a different time when they didn't look at the glass candle like a relic from a time gone. They, it, it, there had to have been a time when the glass candles were at least more recently active or actually active, and apparently we're back to one of those times again now, just starting to enter that. What do the maesters think about that? Are they worried? Do they, are they panicking? Are they like, oh, no, w- these things lighting up mean awful things are about to happen, or are they looking for other explanations? We haven't really gotten to see much of that yet. And of course, you can't help but see the difference, or at least the, rather the similarities, between the concept of gazing into the flame, like Melisandre Thoros given to them by the power of Relore, and seeing the future, or seeing just things far away, and then thinking that obsidian is, a, is, is called frozen fire, and thinking of how that is a similar concept. Maybe this is like a, a more focused version of that concept, where a glass candle takes that, the magical properties, the clairvoyant properties of fire and distills it into a more 
uh, thorough and active tool. Like the difference between a, lo- a cell tower <laughs> uh, or a, a lighthouse and a bonfire, shall we say. Imagine the a fire on top of the high tower. Imagine that was replaced by a halogen beam, right? That kind of thing. So it's a much more powerful, more focused version of the same concept. This is an idea that has been tossed around the fandom for a long time. But this is, this is the place where it comes up. And, and Glass Candles entering the narrative just opens up so many doors. So here's that quote that I referred to earlier that Leo mentions that's just describing this exact, this transition from lower magic era to greater magic era. Dragons and darker things, said Leo. The gray sheep have closed their eyes, but the mastiff sees the truth. Old powers waken, shadows stir. An age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. And look at how Corin Halfhand said it back in Clash of Kings. The, the, it's, the language is, feels similar. The details are different, but it feels very similar. The cold winds are rising. Mormont feared as much. Benj and Stark felt it as well. Dead men walk and the trees have eyes again. Why should we balk at wargs and giants? Yeah, so that's the northern version of this. That's the northern magic coming back. Wargs, giants, others, dead men walking, trees having eyes. Leo's talking about old powers waken, shadows stir, dragons and darker things, etc. He also says the Mastiff sees the truth. That refers back to the point I was making about Quaith and her prophecies about who's going to approach Daenerys. You'd think that would be a, a phrase like that would be used, like the Mastiff comes, you know, something like that. But nope, nothing like that. So it's mentioned that the candle, glass candles can actually, the reason I brought up candles and the wall is that that's actually mentioned as a kind of a side comment. But whether that's true or not, that's another thing. Like, what's going on in that high tower? What, Lord Layton? What's he doing up there? <laughs> his, his daughter, the Mad Maid, is mentioned elsewhere, too, and they're talking about spells, and what the heck? It's so cool, but so mysterious. Here's, um, here's another quote. Some claimed a man could see all the way to the wall from the top. Perhaps that was why Lord Layton had not made the descent in more than a decade, preferring to rule his city from the clouds. And that's the last point made before the alchemist shows up. So speaking of <laughs> dark and darker things, uh, yeah, the magic of the faceless men's pretty dark. Is that a possibility? Well, let's explore a lot of possibilities with the alchemist slash Jake. And he, he met Pate through Rosie. We talked about that. How did he meet her? Well, again, I think it's probably just noticing, just being observant and noticing Pate's being smitten and knowing exactly how to... Suborn that whole thing. What about his access to Maester Walgrave? Like, first of all, the book. Let's start with the thing that we can most touch on that he's looking for. I'm going to skip down here a little bit of Shay and come back to the top there. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we talk about, actually, never mind. I'll just back up and do this in the order I have it laid out. Diggly, 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 wiggly, wiggly. So. Let's talk about the, first of all, we'll start with the proof that I think we've shown this proof before, but we'll review it real fast-like, and this is why we think it's Jock and Hagar. We'll read the two back-to-back quotes here. Okay. Jakin passed a hand down his face from forehead to chin, and where it went, he changed. His cheeks grew fuller, his eyes closer. His nose hooked. A scar appeared on his right cheek where no scar had been before. And when he shook his head, his long straight hair, half red and half white, dissolved away to reveal a cap of tight black curls. And then here's what we see in this chapter. A young man's face, ordinary, with full cheeks in the shadow of a beard. A scar showed faintly on his right cheek. He had a hooked nose and a mat of dense black hair that curled tightly around his ears. It was not a face Pate recognized. So hooked nose, dense black hair curled tightly around his ears. The scar on his right cheek is very distinct. So those are not 
exactly uh, – that's enough to be – this can't be a coincidence, right? There's just too many things that are exactly the same. Full Cheeks is mentioned also. Yeah, every detail is essentially the exact same there. All, but, but what's more important is the concept of what he knows. Pate's knowledge does not go with Pate's death. Meaning Jaken doesn't or Jaken doesn't get to steal that too. That's why he has to have him steal the key first. He can impersonate Pate because Pate's job is taking care of an old senile man who could barely recognize him in the first place. So that's a good disguise because it's not going to be heavily scrutinized by the man he's working for. But Pate's not going to he's not going to know what Pate knows just because he took his identity. He doesn't know where the key was hidden. That's the biggest thing here. He doesn't know where Maester Walgrave has his key stashed. The real Pate did. Once Pate hands over the key, that's the one piece of hidden knowledge that he can't get on his own. Pate's no longer needed. Time to take Pate's place and do, well, do what? That's the big question. There's one answer I think we have, but even that alone doesn't necessarily get us all the way. So let's go through that one thing and then go from there. But first off, one more clue. <laughs> Pate says, who are you? A stranger. No one, truly. No one. <laughs> we know that. But what we learn in Arya's chapters, and this is an interesting thing because it's, again, the power of Valar reread us. We're just rereading in general. I don't want to take all the credit, of course. It's just the power of rereading. We don't know these faceless man rules. We don't know that they're not supposed to go killing on their own or... We don't learn, basically, we just don't learn what the rules of being a faceless man are until after this. This is another example of the riddle, the answer to the riddle coming before the riddle. So we don't know when we read this chapter for the first time that this faceless man seems to be doing things that are not normally done, that might even be completely against the rules. This might be a rogue faceless man, which is interesting because Arya might become the same thing. Not that she'll be going around killing the same people or breaking into the Citadel, but that she may be uh, fallen out of favor with the Faceless Men based on what she does in the Mercy chapter and, See, and hanging on to her identity and all that. So I think this is, that's an interesting idea, the idea of him being a rogue Faceless Man, because would you think that he was rogue at the point that he gave Arya a coin to send her off to do it as well? That's unclear. Good, good question, yeah. I really don't know. Um, but he could be like, F the faceless men. Let me send someone who's, who's sure to be a fly in their honey or That's whatnot. a great idea. Yeah, maybe he just is like, this is another person that will be like me that will <laughs> kind of <laughs> undermine what they're doing. That's a great, interesting idea. I like that theory. Um, so, uh, where was I? Yeah, so the, the key. Here's the curiosity about the key. We, our best guess for what he wants with the key is starts off with this line that we get corroboration from Tyrion later. Uh, the quote is, is it some book you want? Some of the old Valyrian scrolls down in the locked vaults were said to be the only surviving copies in the world. What I want is none of your concern. And that's it. He doesn't press it any further. But we have this similar language from Tyrion in A Dance with Dragons that might give us the answer, or a part answer. And of course, there was even less chance of his coming on the fragmentary, anonymous, blood-soaked tome, sometimes called Blood and Fire, and sometimes The Death of Dragons, the only surviving copy of which was supposedly hitting aw hidden away in a locked vault beneath the citadel. So it makes a lot of sense Jockin would want that book, The Death of Dragons. And why would he want to care, care about killing dragons? Well, because the Bravosi and the Faceless Men hate dragons. It's, it's tied to their origin to hate Valyria. The Faceless Men originated in the mines, the horrible, torturous mines of the 14 Flames. And it's, that's literally how the Faceless Men were formed, in those mines. So they really, really don't like dragons or... Valyrians, really. <laughs> uh, so, the problem is, though, why doesn't he, as we said, Sam, when he stumbles on fake Pate uh, at the end of the book, it's been months. Jockin has infiltrated the Citadel for months by the time Sam stumbles on him. So, couldn't he have gotten this book already? 
Maybe not. Maybe he still doesn't know exactly where this locked vault is. Maybe he hasn't learned where the book is stored. That's entirely possible. On the other hand, he might have more that he wants to do there. Maybe that book is is just one of several goals he has. And either way, it doesn't fit with what we know about how the faceless men operate. How when, when do faceless men steal books? When do faceless like this is weird, right? It just doesn't exactly fit with what we've been taught about faceless men through Arya's POV. To be fair, there is a lot we don't know. About. She's at the very lowest level. You're right. Absolutely. Definitely. There's there's just there's possibly secrets there, but it, it still contradicts what we've been taught in some ways, you know? It's not like maybe they'll say, well, actually, when you reach a higher level of the faceless men, you can do things completely differently. That's possible. But it's still a curiosity. Uh, a somewhat but not entirely tinfoil theory is that Jockin is still in the employ of Euron. Given the strong evidence for Balon's death at the hands of the Faceless Men, it may be that Jockin was the operator that did it. But it doesn't have to be the case. There are plenty of Faceless Men. Yeah, it doesn't have to be him at all. And, <clears throat> in fact, I mean, this is the, the, the disguise he was wearing when he meets the Alchemist is the one he's wearing when he left Harrenhal. So... What did he change into to look like an ironborn to get close to Balon and then change back into this tight headed, you know, tight, curly headed, scarred face? I, I don't I don't know. So still, it's another option for if Jockin and Euron are in concert still or working together, it opens up a lot of possibilities like, well, this is a way for the Ironborn to get inside the city. Jockin could uh, open a gate for them. He seems capable of doing that. I mean, he's, he could betray the city from the inside. But there's no foreshadowing or anything for this that I'm aware of. And also, why would the Faceless Men work with a guy who's trying to ride a dragon or, and to, to enslave half the world? Again, that argues for either they don't know what he's really doing or that he's working with some rogue Faceless Man that doesn't share the values of the rest of his guild. So, and that's going to be a conflict for the Faceless Men and Danny as well, because they don't like the dragons, but they love the bashing and wrecking of the slave trade. <laughs> but that's a little, well, it's, it's kind of getting off topic here. It's a related topic, but not quite. Um, that's all I have to say I, I about I think it's worth mentioning that there is a, we have a decent amount of talk about the Faceless Men in our Doom of Valyria episode. That's true. We do have, a, that's, that's right. That's an older episode, but we do talk about it. And we do have a, specifically have a Faceless Man in the Iron Bank episode oh, yeah, from Fire yeah. and Blood. So we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, some of these thoughts I'm saying here in this episode are a little bit new, though. Um, but, but a lot of it is, uh, is handled a little more thoroughly or uh, just from a different approach in some of our other episodes. So I definitely recommend some of those. Um, another option, though, is, is the communication here. It's something I forgot to mention. I skipped past this, now I'm going to come back to it. Pate's job is to look after Maester Walgrave. Maester Walgrave is, of course, senile and, and well past his time, but he was the Master of Ravens. Well, he is the Master of Ravens. Now they say he's, he's only got the title. Someone else is actually doing the job. But it occurs to me that Master of Ravens is like the, the head of communications for the, the whole continent. I mean... All the Ravens know so much. They pass so many messages back and forth, and there's a lot of spying potential for someone in this position. You could learn a lot by looking at all the different messages that get passed to the Citadel, to the High Tower, maybe, whatever he has access to. Wow, that's a lot of information. And it just so happens to be in the hands of a man who is incredibly senile, so it's information that's very open to being stolen. Um, and that fits in also with the concept of the glass candle. Maybe Jockin wants to use this glass candle to communicate afar uh, in secret. And that's a little, little more um, tinfoily. But we want to run through the possibilities because maybe even if we don't nail the right possibility, we get close enough that it starts a new discussion that gets us the rest of the way. That is the nature of theorizing. Joe Buckley notes the gold coin, the dragon, is discussed here a lot in this chapter because Rosie is uh, paid, is trying to save up for uh, to have a gold dragon. And it's mentioned that there's a gold king, a gold coin with a dragon on one side and a dead king on the other side, which is a little bit of an important note because we're about to see uh, the coinage matter when uh, Varus plants, probably, plants uh, 
some reach coins in the black cells to make it look like the Tyrells were involved in setting Tyrion free because Cersei's easy to fool. <laughs> Joe also asked an interesting question about the five-year gap, wondering if, you know, Pate would have just not existed or if this would have been a, a, a poor dude that's been chainless for 10 years instead of five <laughs> or if he just would have changed Pate's age who knows but uh it's interesting to see to think about that he also notes the relationship between Sorella and Leo Sorella knows who Leo is obviously because Leo's not hiding his identity but Leo doesn't know who Sorella is but they both kind of jaw back and forth they don't like each other I mean no one really likes Leo but they both have started working with Marwin uh Leo quotes Marwin and Sorella, of course, as we already mentioned, approaches Sam in his chapter and is like, hey, Marwin saw you coming through the glass candle. Nina points out how ironic it is that this is the only book in the series where there's no dragons, yet the first line of the book is dragons and they start talking about dragons. So <laughs> that's probably, that may not have been George's original intent. <laughs> he probably uh, had planned it differently, but it grew on him. The tale grew in the telling, as we know, as we say. Okay, that was an extremely long chapter of discussion, but we knew it would be. That's part of why we only did three chapters this week. We've got a lot of questions and comments here. <clears throat> yeah, I see a lot of super chats. Let's get through those first. Emily Pollard says, I have caught the live chat for the first time. Nothing to add but to express my appreciation for the hard work you put into these Valar Ruritas. Thank you very much, Emily. Glad you could make it. Catherine Furseth, as usual, filled with admiration for the level of knowledge you guys have of the books. Thanks for all you do. Well, we appreciate you saying so, Catherine. We will continue to try to do our best. Amy L., thanks for your hard work. Ashay and Aziz, which Feast POV is your favorite? Ooh. Do you know yours off the bat? I know mine. Go ahead. Uh, for me, out of the people with, you know, a decent number of chapters, Sam, 100%. Riveted Ooh. every time I see his chapters. Was dying to get back to a Sam chapter. Where was he going next? You know, what was he doing? Um, for the ones with shorter, I mean, she only has two chapters, but Ariane, 100% for me. But... With two chapters, it's a little unfair. Yeah. Those mm. two. It's really, it, it's tough. There aren't, like, there are a, a more distribution of chapters in this one. I, I'm, I'm leaning Brienne, but I kind of want to, I kind of want to say Sam also. Yeah, it's a, it's a good plot line. I'm, I yeah. love it. <laughs> I'll keep thinking about it, but that's, that's where I'll say, I'll say Sam You can now. have, you know, one woman, one man. Yeah, I mean, I do like Cersei's POV, even it's tricky, but it's an easy one because she's the most uh, prominent POV in terms of pure number of pages in this one. Um, yeah, it's tough. That's a really one, tough one, We'll guys. get to talk about it again in our uh, Feast for Crows review at the end, our wrap-up at the end of the season. Yeah, good point, good point. Well, I'll, I'll think yeah. about it even more after we've we gone through it again. this a season. <laughs> yeah, season. A season <laughs> hey. of oh, Valar yeah. Reredus. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to submit it to IMDb. Well, there are a lot of questions here, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, in particular, there are also a huge list of people answering our question for groups of pates. Okay, cool. Uh, Ainsley M. sends a coffee pair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate that so much. Okay, so we have a we lot alternate? of feedback here. Should we alternate? Yeah, let's read these alternating. Uh, Freestyle Fakiri says, remember, this is uh, the chat has come up with Names for a group of pates. <laughs> Freestyle Fakiri says a platter of pates. John Hagee says a sty of pates. <laughs> Tracy McMillan says a paterson. Paterian. A paterian. Oh, yes. I said that wrong. You're right. A paterian. Richard Tabor, a pasting of pates. <laughs> Tempest Brewer, a frolic of pates. Scott McCloy, a pate party or a party of pates. <laughs> That's however you good. Want to say it. Inside Lewin Martell says a pallet of pates. Like That's that good. One. Lady Leaf Underhill, a spread of pates. Oh, nice. Taff says a pitter patter of pates. Yeah. Uh, Girl Nettles, a patsy of pates. <laughs> Brandon Winslow says a plate of pates, mm -hmm. and it's a faceless man's dinner. <laughs> and nice. Kirk Evans references uh, the the famous Parliament of Owls, mm. um, and says a Parliament of pates. Oh yeah. The Bjorn Gagnat says all I know is that a group of Jojans is called a paste. Oh. A paste of Jojans. Yes. Nice. Uh, Jamie McKenna. <laughs> Pate Posse, what's up? <laughs> what up? Brandon Winslow with another one says, Procession of Pates, that's good. Tempest Brewer, has anyone said a murder of Pates? <laughs> that's a good one. That's and I'll very read fitting. mine here. I came up with a bunch in reading them. Okay. Uh, I have a peep of Pates, <laughs> a pitying of Pates, a poverty of Pates, 
And my favorite, a pretense of pace. <laughs> a pretense of pace because it's a fake because we have uh, the alchemist taking his place. And yes. a poverty of pace because he's trying to save money. That's Those great. are all real collective nouns, by the way. <laughs> oh, oh, they're, they already exist. They already are in use, like real ones. Uh, so I don't like a pitying of doves, I think it is. A poverty of what's that one for? I don't know. I don't, I've don't. i heard it. I, I'm not sure, actually, anymore, but Good it question. is. Okay. Well, anyway, moving on from that, great job, chat. <laughs> that was <laughs> awesome. Zajan Body says, Old Town is such an ultimate fantasy city located in such a high state or high late medieval French realm with a big important sept and a university, a mystic ancient house of rulers. Yeah, well said. Good synopsis there. Uh, Zajan Body also says, George Martin has read about the three little pigs. Hmm. Because, of course, we've got King's Landing and Old Town. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Brandon Winslow says, Winterfell is mostly stone, and when it gets burned, it can come back. Rather, it does come back. Good point. Yeah, like the, the wooden parts of it are burned. The stone is scorched. But, yeah, Old Town can't truly burn. It can just, parts of it can burn, but the whole city cannot burn to the ground. That's a, that's a good point. And, and, and it could be rebuilt more easily than, say, King's Landing. Other uh, parts of King's Landing will be harder to burn. Unless there's wildfire involved, and then all bets are off. But I, I don't foresee wildfire at Old Town. Let's put it that way. I see no reason to, to see that coming. It would be a surprise. Tree Girl wonders if perhaps Jockin slash Pate is using the, the glass candle, like I had suggested, but the reason being can't steal it. Like, it only works there for some reason. Uh, there is magic associated with that area. Uh, Battle Isle. Um, it's, it was a, a, a place where magic-using people came together, uh, as we talked about with Archmaester Periston, or the Par Paramore, uh, not Archmaester Periston, rather, but uh, Lord Paramore. Or I guess that was a king. Anyway, same difference. Uh, Charlie One One mentions Armin's comment to Molander, ha uh, quote, or how they spent a year in the belly of a fish. That is a Moby Dick reference. Nice catch there by Charlie One One. Very good. I like this line from Armin, which he warns Pace is, the night is damp and the cobbles will be slippery. <laughs> so the night is dark and the, full of terrors. And indeed, he yeah. is killed by a terror shortly after this the warning. The night is damp and full of co slippery cobbles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and they made sure to mention status and, and R'hllor just before that yeah. to make sure our mind was like at least touching on that little bit. <laughs> Good comment from Matt Reese here. In the prologue, the readers see the residents of Old Town, not just the Citadel, just living day to day like normal with the events around the rest of the realm, just something that is happening elsewhere and not really affecting them. The, the War of Five Kings hasn't really touched them, it just, which is kind of wild to think about such a big, huge civil war impacting so many people in Old Town. It's just like, yeah, that's happening, but not here. But at the end of this book, when Sam arrives in Old Town, there's already broken galleys, evidence of, of fighting, and, and all the talk of the Ironborn's multiple attempts to get inside the city. So they're completely on in a different state than they are right now. You got the Pate state and the Sam state. At the end of the book, they're preparing for war, but not realizing just how bad uh, it looks for them. They don't realize what forces Euron is marshalling, nor how clever he is, nor how determined and awful he is they're used to old school ironborn the raiding and looting and runaway kind this is this is not your father's ironborn scott wartman says the house tallin has no targaryen blood that we know of yeah there must be and some I, I i wanted to speak to this okay, myself go for it. which is that we haven't seen it technically via the family tree but given the marriage that that uh, into House Martell through Maron married Daenerys and they had multiple kids, but we don't know the Martell family tree. Yeah. They had multiple kids, but we have no idea what happened to them and who they married. So there's a lot of room actually in Dorne for there to be some Targaryen blood. Yeah, the, I agree, totally agree with that. The blood would have gone through the Martell side and through that Princess Daenerys and all that. Yeah, yeah we, we just don't know who married into who. I could see there's other, I'm sure, like, those Martell kids, they married into other Dornish houses. Yeah, so. and, and, and there's say, definitely multiple houses within Dorn that have it. And as you say, the Daenerys, it's, it's, we don't know how many kids Maron and Daenerys had, but they had, quote, multiple kids. Yes. So it definitely We don't even know their, their first kid, the Prince of Dorn, who, who inherited. We don't even know that right. person's name. So, so that's a great point by Scott, because we... Uh, it gave us a chance to explain that. Yes. So thanks for, thanks for bringing that up, Scott. 
Wheezy squeeze boxes, I always wondered, was Gilly still on the ship when Marwyn took it to Essos? That's where Sam left her. And I just cracked up at that idea of, like, all of a sudden Gilly discovers she was on her way to dragons. <laughs> that would be incredible. They were just like, the ship captain's like, wait, we still have, he's like, no, Marwyn's like, now nah, let's go, now. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a funny point. Yeah, I wouldn't think so, but damn, that would be crazy, wouldn't it? I, I think that she's probably got off the sh- I don't know. I can't imagine she would just sail, be like, yeah, yeah I'm going to stay go. on the ship. I think she, like, she would be able to tell they're getting ready to sail and she would get off. I must admit, I never thought about that. Beryl Raider says Marwin is taking Eamon's body to Daenerys. I don't think so. I think they took the body off the, the ship. But that would also be interesting to be like, <laughs> hey, by the way, here's your great uncle <laughs> or great great uncle or whatever he is exactly like, in a cask of brandy or whatever, the <laughs> rum or whatever he is. You thirsty? You know, it'd be better if it was tequila, because tequila—they always put a worm inside tequila. Oh. You know, and he's a worm, right? Dragon <laughs> eh, worm. Yeah. W Y. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Catherine Furseth says maybe they went there to study their enemies. That is, people who use magic. Oh, yeah. That's obviously referring to going to the the stories of going to Valyria. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Okay. That's an interesting idea. Yeah, like no be- no better way to undermine magic than to learn how it works so you know exactly where it, what its weaknesses are and things like that. Good good idea, Catherine. I mean, whether this was a united effort, that would apply to some of them. It would give them that ability, potentially, whether that was what they were aiming for or not. So, yeah, very good idea. Liat Rubenfeld says, I wonder if the anti-magic is not just a maester thing, but a high tower anti-dragon thing from the Dawn Age. Hmm. That's interesting, too. Because, yeah, they wouldn't, you know, dragons in Westeros would not be a plus for anyone, really, when back before people knew how to tame them, if they did at all at that in that time. So you could see why maybe they would develop anti-dragon measures <laughs> or at least have anti-dragon attitudes. Obviously, the modern high towers during the Dance of the Dragons were trying to become part of the Targaryen family aggressively. I mean, they were the basic, they were the greens, basically. Uh, so they weren't anti-dragon during that time frame, but we're talking about thousands of years, so attitudes can shift and change and then shift back, etc. Brandon Winslow, it's also possible that the House of Black and White has a higher level and they send people on more extended missions, like a Navy SEAL slash Faceless Man. Oh, yeah, so like as they rise through the ranks, they get more complicated missions. Something like do what you have to do, anything goes, this is too important. I mean, if Jockin is after something like a mission to kill dragons. That would go above and beyond what the faceless men normally do, but it's also very in line with their basic core attitudes. So having more leeway would make sense under such auspices. So I like that. Good thinking, Brandon. Lady Leaf Underhill says he told her she could use the coin to find him. Would that work if he were rogue? Oh. Also a very good point. Um... Because that refers to Jockin handing Arya the coin and saying, you know, use this coin to find me. Well, maybe, but honestly, the coin hasn't done that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good question, though. It makes me think. I, I, don't really, I don't really know. But it's also possible he went rogue later. Uh, but, you know, mm, the rogue theory is, is a little thin. It's an idea, and you, you're giving us a good example of, of why maybe it doesn't work. N. Kirk Evans doubts Jake and his rogue. Faceless man rules seem more like best practices. They largely seem flexible. They they seem like an ends justify the means sort of organization. Yeah, that's a good point. They just, to them, getting the job done would would matter. They obviously can't have people taking their teachings uh, and using them for their own ideals. They're so powerful. When you make someone a faceless man, you're imbuing them with incredible ability to take life. And it would make sense to keep that you know, controlled to keep, you know, to only put that power in the hands of people who show how they know how to use it. But how would such a practice, how would that uh, honesty and that integrity be maintained for so long? How would that not get corrupted over time or at least be corrupted from time to time? It, I, I submit that it, that's not possible. No, no organization can be fully free of corruption for that long, uh, so perfectly. There has to be cracks in the foundation. Even if this isn't an example of that specifically. Jonathan Hagee says, is this whole chapter a maester pate, maester bait joke and George is trolling us? 
<laughs> Maester Pate. <laughs> expiration Pate. Oh, that's another one from him. Uh, this is the expiration. That's yeah, why you I put that last. I just had to highlight. He had some good jokes today. That is good. Good job, Jonathan. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I mean, if Pate had just masturbated, he would be alive. <laughs> I'm just saying. Damn. Damn. Okay, let us move on to the prophet. The king is dead, a.k.a. the gang calls for a king's moot. Thanks to Theon, this is not the truly first Ironborn chapter, but Theon's detachment from the place and culture was significant. With him and Asha and Victorian, we truly go deep into Ironborn lifestyles and beliefs. They are as blunt and brutal as this first sentence. The prophet was drowning men on Great White. Oops. The prophet was drowning men on Great Wick when they came to tell him the king was dead. Just bam. <laughs> like, no subtlety, no mincing words, just a straight description. First, some really obvious foray into some chapters being really out of whack time wise. I mean, this is, this is, this is a pretty far back. We're going back to around the time Arya is kidnapped by Sandor. This is around when Balon died, apparently. This is sort of guesstimating, roughly. But that's a pretty far back, even if that guess is a little off. Fascinating that George chose to open this book, prologue aside, of course, with Aaron, a character who is barely featured in three chapters, two books, and six years prior, basically. <laughs> but it's a smart choice. We see the audience come in almost as fresh as Aaron himself to hearing the news of Balon's death. So we get the point of view from someone who's just experiencing this, even though we knew it had happened already. So it's a good way to kind of push the reset button there and get us back in line with that. One of the major questions of A Feast for Crows is what happens to a society and a family when its long-established defining figure is removed. And that's really true here because... Balon is a defining figure, even though he wasn't that good of a leader. There was no doubt that he was fully in charge for a long time and led his people to a lot of not-so-great things. But just looking at how much Aaron reveres him and how big a deal his death is goes to show that he, how dependent they were on him despite all his many shortcomings I mean, Aaron is by no means likable, but I find him fascinating, and I do feel a bit sorry for him, thanks to how he apparently is going to end and all the things that led up to the life he has now. I mean, there's no forgiving some of the things he's done, but damn, his upbringing was rough, and Euron just sexually assaulting him on a regular basis, sexually assaulting his brother that slept next to him on a regular basis, just awful. Euron killing his brothers, the, you just can't... It's hard to not feel sympathy for a victim of, of sexual abuse, even when the person is awful, because you can't help but think that some of the abuse they're inflicting on others is because of the abuse inflicted on them when they were so young. And this is an abusive culture. I mean, this is an abusive person, an abused person with an extremely abusive, brutal culture. So it's not like he's going to find sympathy anywhere. When he was young, when he's older, they're just going to say, no, no deal with it. And that's how Aaron's attitude is in the beginning of this chapter. He's like, every breath of life is something that you must struggle for. That's the, the he almost like is enthralled with this. He almost like appreciates that. Like he's, it's like a good thing. I'm like, God dang, this is, this is a harsh outlook. Really, really harsh. It's hard to understand. We get even closer to seeing how much their worship is reminiscent of a worship of death. I mean, it, it it's really stands out to me how much they choose suffering as part of their worship. They embrace the worst aspects of human existence. Suffering, toil, rejection of the tools of reason and technology, the very things that can reduce or eliminate suffering and toil. They reject that. Choosing life, choking salt water over life-giving fresh water is a perfect example. I mean, the guy drinks salt water. What on earth? <laughs> And drowning, the concept of drowning is like you're dead for a few seconds, even though the whole thing is just CPR. I think it's kind of it's funny that they look at this thing as magical when it's really just you're killing someone and then bringing them back to life. <laughs> but it's entirely human. There's nothing magical about it. And worse, on top of all this, he has a very deep, authentic desire to spread this belief, to spread this style of worship, of attitude, of facing the world with 
embracing the brutality and, and awfulness of it. It's important to note how much contrast there is between Aaron and the men who come to inform him of Balon's death. The, quote, rough spun robe, both Aaron and his new brother, priest, Don, and the cudgel, the driftwood cudgel that they receive. This is the most basic stuff ever. I mean, cavemen would almost have that. I mean, they wouldn't have a robe, but they would have similar garments and they would wield, they would be as well equipped as a, a driftwood cudgel. Are you kidding me? That is so... So low tech and weak. It's so bizarre. <laughs> Aaron himself is like a wild man, like a, a quote, naked but for a sealskin clout that covered his private parts, with hair that, quote, draped his shoulders like a ragged, ropey cloak and fell down past his waist. A tangled, uncut beard. The the Aaron that we briefly see on TV doesn't look anything like this. That Aaron is like older and different, and it's just you may as well ignore that guy and pretend he's some other iron priest seaweed through his beard I, I honestly don't think that uh, uh, most of the art of Aaron that's out there doesn't do justice to just how creepy and weird and and uh you know n naturalistic he looks just so bah <laughs> just so creepy man there's a timelessness to this ceremony too showing how long these beliefs have held which just adds to the creepiness that this this style of worship and religion has existed for thousands of years but it used to be, but it's been going away. It's been slowly dying off. And this guy wants to bring it back. Yeah. I mean, his own, his own father was trying to get rid of it partially, at least trying to dial it down a bit. But Aaron is a different animal. And these men that Aaron is doing his work here, and he doesn't even notice that there's other Ironborn watching that have ridden up. And here's a little quote that, that shows that. That was when the damp hair realized that three horsemen had joined his drowned men on the pebbled shore. Some of it's reverence right there. They don't want to interrupt a holy rite, but you get the sense that they don't fully like it either. It's a little disturbing. Like they're they're respectful of it because it is their the drowned men have a lot of power in the Iron Islands. But ooh, he, like he's holding back. He's kind of like, I don't know about this. And this is Gorman Goodbrother is dressed up in a red line for a cloak, pinned at the shoulder with an ornate brooch with his house's, house's sigil. He's riding on a horse, which Aaron isn't a big fan of horses. He scorns them, you know. Uh, he, thinks, he thinks they make men weak. Like, I mean, Aaron thinks everything, any shortcut of any kind makes you weak, basically. I mean, this is a dude that <laughs> puts seaweed in his hair and, and won't wield anything made of steel. He's like, yeah, cudgels, that's the way to go. And in the prologue, we see a place in the Citadel that resists magic, perhaps conspiring against it, but definitely arguing against it in place of, you know, rational explanations. Here, Aaron does the opposite. Like any zealot would, he frames everything through his religious worldview. Everything that's happening around him is because of the two gods. Like I said, the kiss of life appears to be just CPR, but not in his mind. In his mind, it's, the, it's a treasured, magical experience, a gift from God that just keeps on happening. Every fish is a gift from the drowned god. Every storm is a curse from the storm god. Going to the watery halls upon death is surely a hearkening to the concept of Valhalla, which means hall of the slain. Mm -hmm. Watery halls, hall of the slain, where the dead go. I mean, it's pretty similar. And in both, there's an endless, there's endless feasting and drinking and telling of tales. That's, that sounds like Valhalla also. But real-life worshippers of Odin have more to do with trees than relationships to beings under the sea. Don't be, don't take the Norse connections too far, though they are legion and, and plenty. But the other part of Ironborn origin is probably less real-world myth and more mm, H.P. Lovecraft slash weird fiction slash eldritch horror. <laughs> I mean, associating them with... Well, the same beings that may have built that high tower base, the same oily black stone that is the origin of the sea stone chair that might come from beneath the sea or from some super, a supernatural origin or both. Incredibly old evidence of an ancient seaborne humanoid race exists. And I, when I say seaborne, I don't mean sailing. I mean, if you go back far enough, the blood of the ironborn may contain something very disturbing. 
as the Targaryens seem to have some real blood of the dragons somewhere in their heritage that seems to still linger in their genetics. The Ironborn may have some real blood of, for lack of a better term, we'll use the one from H.P. Lovecraft, the Deep Ones. The Deep Ones are referenced not by name, but all throughout the world of Ice and Fire and other places as having perhaps existed in this place or another. There's a, a place uh, far to the east, North Essos, uh, called the Thousand Islands, where the people are afraid have been are permanently afraid of the sea because of what used to come out of it. <laughs> and it sounds like these deep ones might be the things that used to come out of it. Stay away from the shore to avoid them, which is ironic because in this chapter, Aaron thinks about how men like Gorold Goodbrother, who live inland, uh, so far inland that they can't see the sea, that this is a bad thing. So it's kind of a reverse that you should always be near the sea because, well, this is where they came from originally. So, but I'd have a new thought on their origin that I can't recall seeing elsewhere. Another testament to the depth available to us on this depth, ha, ocean puns. The fact that they drink seawater, or at least that he does. Now, it's not clear how much seawater he drinks. Maybe he only has a little bit. And if he only has a little bit from time to time, that's no big deal. I mean, it's not nothing. But it's, it's not enough for this theory. But if he drinks it more than that, and I think he does. I mean, he filled up a whole water skin with it and immediately took a sip. We don't see him, like, taking sips from it all the time. But we don't see him, like, drinking fresh water either. And, he, and we also know... Well, he's not a big drinker of alcohol anymore, and he used to be. So he's not doing that either. Um, so again, like the Targaryen partial disease resistance or mild heat resistance, perhaps the Ironborn have a little extra salt resistance? Normally, if you drink a lot of salt water, now I'm no expert on this. Maybe some doctor or health expert should weigh in. But my understanding is that you, build, you drink salt water, and the salt gets deposited in your digestive system or somewhere else in your body because you can't flush it out, you need, and you need to flush that out. You need more water than the water in salt water to flush out the salt that you imbibe by drinking salt water. That's why it's so bad for you, because you need a greater volume of fresh water to undo the damage of the salt water you just drank. In other words, get enough fluid in your body, and you can pass that out, and some of that salt will go with it. It's, it's not really likely Aaron is measuring his quantities of water that much, that he's actively... because. Aaron doesn't think along logical processes. He, his faith guides him entirely. He does what he thinks the God tells him to do. There's no, you know what, I think I've had too much salt. <laughs> I better have some fresh water. That is not at all how his mind works. And I just can't help but notice that included with Aaron is this story about how amazing he is at urinating. <laughs> it's like, wait. So, and this thing about salt water, which builds up because... You can't pee properly. We have this story about him being really incredible at peeing. Like, and I'm not talking about Euron. This isn't Euronating, nor his brother Eurigon that died young. So not Eurinating either. But these are stories connected to him being, um, you know, his, his drinking tales. That's when he became such a big peer. And he doesn't do that anymore either. So, I don't know, it's suspicious in a spooky way. It might just be, there might not be anything to it, but it might be like an evolutionary thing or it might be a supernatural thing. This blood connection, if it's real, it's older than the existence of Valyria even. So that's something to keep in mind, that this is even more ancient than dragon lore or anything. We're talking like Great Empire of the Dawn era, maybe, if not before that, even. So talk about some of the timelines that are thrown around in the prologue about how old the world is. That's a briefly mentioned topic. Well, that's the type of scale we're talking about long, long ago. Another, another caveat applies here as well. George R. R. Martin's humans already work differently than real-world humans, so I, I definitely i am not going to listen to uh, too much on how saltwater in the real world works as far as rejecting what George has done. I'm interested in it to know how it works, but it's not going to prove anything about George specifically, or George's world specifically, because he changed how genetics work. He changed how little things like that work. He changed how obsidian works. Real world and George's world, don't cross that up too much. If George says it works one way in Westeros, that's how it works. Real world examples don't mean anything. All they can do is teach us maybe where George got the idea. But in world trumps real world when we're dealing with the story. So 
We also get some um, wider Iron, Iron Island geography, the kind of stuff that we couldn't really get from Theon because, well, when he was only 10, he probably didn't know the Iron Islands that well in terms of geography, and 10 is when he left. However, Aaron is there all the time. Aaron rides to a place called Hammerhorn, the seat of House Goodbrother. This is the... Uh, this is kind of an obvious play on Aaron's situation. Aaron feels he has lost his, quote, good brother, Balon, and is now left thinking of the rest of his brothers in the struggle for the throne. Historically, House Good Brother claims descent and almost certainly derives its name from the legendary Grey King's leal eldest brother and is the only major Ironborn house not to spring from one of the Grey King's hundred sons who slew one another in an attempt to take their father's crown. Hmm, hearkening to what's happening here. <laughs> Everyone, you know, we're back to this place where they're fighting for a crown. And, of course, Aaron himself's brother is going to get the Seastone chair and be himself a, a, a reborn bad brother, so to speak. And here's that bit I was mentioning. This kind of refers to what I was talking about before about how the good brother lands are inland and that gives them a bit of a different cultural niche within the Ironborn. And uh, it's part of expanding the Ironborn story. I think this is an interesting quote. Gorald's folk toiled down in Gorald's mines in the stony dark beneath the earth. Some lived and died without setting eyes upon salt water. This is also the family that took the crown during the case of Torgon the Latecomer. Uh, that there was another good brother that got nicknamed bad brother during that time. He won the the king's moot and was such a horrible king that they looked for ways to get rid of him. And they did so by finding a technicality that this guy Torgon should have been eligible for the king's moot, but he was off reaving. And so they reheld the king's moot and he won and then was over then over through the bad brother. So this is sort of replaying some of that. It's 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 very noteworthy which houses George picked for this chapter and the good brother choice is extremely distinct and important that doesn't take us to the king's moot of course because well that was a story about the king's moot and that is the loudest feature of this chapter though not as loud as the dragon horn itself which which will be blown in aaron's next chapter much to his eternal chagrin it starts with self-defeating considerations of the succession though really <laughs> he just he just undermines his own plans by being forced into it by having to follow the old ways. The rigid, ironborn old ways does not allow him for a lot of imagination or flexibility, and Euron masterfully takes advantage of that lack of flexibility. He's like, well, you, I, I can predict how you're going to behave because you're very predictable, and Euron's far too clever to not be able to take full advantage of that. Yeah, it's like a hardline approach for the, for the old way uh, is... Too inflexible. Good brother remarks that Euron has had Lord Sawain Botley drowned in a cask of seawater for proclaiming that Theon is the rightful heir. And Aaron's like, well, he drowned him. There was no blood. So technically he didn't spill the blood of Ironborn. Ironborn aren't supposed to spill the blood of Ironborn. And, and Euron managed to stick to the rules technically. And so Aaron has to give him a pass because technically the, his fundamentalist reading of the rules is that's that's okay. You could say he's technically correct. <laughs> and that is the best kind of correct. <laughs> that's true. That is true. Religiously correct. <laughs> Important to note, Swain Botley was drowned specifically because of, like I said this, but we got to come back to this for a second. Theon should be heir, right? And that's also, that ties into this whole Torgon the Latecomer story because... Theon missed the king's moot, and, well, that might come up. So, keep that in your back pocket. Uh, and Euron, too, by sitting the Seastone chair, he has further exploited their system, both for his own gain and the pleasure of manipulation, which he seems to have legitimate, uh, he legitimately enjoys messing with people. Euron reiterates here that Asha is disqualified from ruling, and doesn't even bother to name Theon as a potential candidate. But Euron remains the troublesomely, uh, troublesomely obvious next candidate. So he, Aaron's like, okay, not him, not him. That leads us with Euron, but uh, I don't want him either. So he has to kind of break the rules to go to proclaim Victorian king. So you can kind of see how this is all going to fall apart. Yet he's so proud of himself, so sure it's going to work because he trusts in his faith and he thinks the drowned god couldn't possibly couldn't possibly side with Euron 
Because to him, Euron is like the embodiment of the storm god. It's like being this really devout religious person who thinks God is on their side only to see that the devil is winning. It's wild. It, it's, it's hard to see just how deep of a blow, how harmful that is to Aaron's psyche. Aaron thinks he's just come up with a master stroke, though. He thinks the king's moot, because of his deep beliefs, he's like, well, well of course the king's moot will result in a good thing. It'll, it'll take us in the right direction because it's this holy ritual that how could the drowned god steer us wrong? If we put our faith in him, we can't not win. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy, but it's definitely how he thinks. And he's, his, part of his incredible confidence is why his, he comes crashing down so hard. I mean, Aaron truly becomes the prophet in this moment. He really thinks he's bringing, ushering in a new era. He's very proud of himself for his service to the god. He invokes the Merlin to stay and listen that you may spread God's word, telling him that he's the voice of the drowned God on earth. He's saying, look, I am, he's basically saying I'm Jesus or something, the ironborn Jesus. The word is particularly potent here, invoking not only an appropriately marine image of fish gathered into a single strong unit, he, he, he calls it a school. He says Aaron's school, right? Upon his natural pedestal. And he says, the drowned God gave me eyes to see, ears to hear, and a voice to spread his word, that I might be his prophet and teach his truth to those who have forgotten. It's, it's so over the top, but this is, the, this is the lifestyle of people on the Iron Islands. This is not, he's a zealot, but the regular folk aren't that far off from his belief system, or at least they're close enough to it that they can be swept away in it and be like, yeah, this is a great idea. But of course it all backfires because he leads them by trying to lead them away to Euron, lay away from Euron, he leads them directly to him. And it's like, it's like he thinks, he's like he's calling for a new a pope election, it's like a papal election that he thinks, well, God will only choose the best possible candidate. God's hand will be involved in this selection. And then at the end of the day, they pick a Satanist. And to him, it's obvious that this person is a Satanist. He's like, Y'all, this guy's a Satanist. Why did we just elect him Pope? <laughs> so let's talk. Let's, let's quote him real quick, because this is just such an epic, awesome quote. Um, even though we've mostly discussed its, the, the, the meaning and, and uh, application of it. I just can't resist saying it. And look at how shocking it is, though. This, this high lord of the Iron Islands is like, whoa, what? The Merlin gaped at him. A king's moot? There has not been a true king's moot in... I'm sorry, I, I thought that was my first sentence. Uh, will you say it again, please? The Merlin gaped at him. A king's moot? There has not been a true king's moot in... Too long a time, Aaron cried in anguish. Yet in the dawn of days, the Ironborn chose their own kings, raising up the worthiest amongst them. It is time we return to the old way, for only that shall make us great again. It was a king's moot that chose Eurus iron foot for high king and placed a driftwood crown upon his brows. Silas Flatnose, Herrig Hor, the old kraken, the king's moot raised them all. And from this king's moot shall emerge a man to finish the work King Balon has begun and win us back our freedoms. Go not to Pike, nor to the Ten Towers of Harlaw, but to Old Wick, I say again. Seek the Hill of Naga and the bones of the Grey King's Hall, for in that holy place, when the moon has drowned and come again, we shall make ourselves a worthy king, a godly king. Powerful stuff. Yeah, of course, he's going to end up rejecting the results of the moot because it elects Euron, but it's going to be too late. He's going to have really just hoisted himself by his own petard there. And then, well, we'll return to his story later. Uh, you know, we don't want to go too far ahead here. And, yeah, it's just, in summation for him, he's already begun to associate Euron with godhood and thinking about him as, as, as the storm god or the agent of the storm god. And that's really what we're going to see later. I mean, Euron in the Forsaken chapter is outright saying he's going to challenge the gods. He's 
wants to basically replace them. And he wants people to worship him almost instead of the other gods, and that's part of why he's collecting priests and these visions of blood and pre a different uh, heads of religion uh, speared on the Iron Throne and these visions. It's really stunning and powerful. And, you know, there's... Uh, Aaron just doesn't see any of it coming, even though he, more than anyone, knows... Euron is not to be taken lightly, that he's dangerous. There's no way for him to spread the word enough, and there's no way for him to, for him even to know just how bad Euron really is. It says a lot that the guy who's most aware of Euron's awfulness can't fathom how awful Euron truly is. Joe asks a good question here. Is drowning only for men? Was Asha drowned? I honestly don't know. I can't. Th I, I didn't have an answer to that, and I, I was pretty sure that I don't. There's nothing specifically mentioned about it, so that might be part of why he thinks women can't rule. Not just because he thinks everyone has to be strong, and in his mind, women can't are too weak. But if they're not drowned properly, if they're not baptized properly, then then religious wise, that you could see why like a zealot a would decent would, point time for me to bring up uh, something that's going to be in our Q and A later. Um, which is that Richard Tabor asks, he says, didn't Aaron tell Theon in Theon 1 that Asha did have a claim to the throne? And then here, you know, he's adamant that she can't sit the throne. Um, where uh, Jaded Redhead said that Aaron was like, you ain't the damn heir, you got uncles and an older sister. So at least to Theon's face, Aaron considered Asha a contender. Yeah, he doesn't like, see, he doesn't consider see, Theon doesn't, a contender either. So I think he would thing, just yeah. really be spitting in his face with that. Like, even the girl is ahead of you. That's a good potentially. point. Potentially. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I feel like if there's any chance he thinks she is even remotely someone who could rule, she would have to be drowned. That's a good point. Yeah, so maybe she has been, it just isn't talked about. But that's a very good question. I never did think about that. Interesting, too, to see the way their society works, that Aaron is basically above a lot of the lords in terms of his authority, partly because he's a Greyjoy, but partly because the drowned men have a lot of power on the Iron Island, something that's dealt, uh, a lot of discussion time is spent in the world of Ice and Fire showing that, discussing that they are a lot more powerful than, say, Septons walking around, because their people are a lot more zealous. And um, yeah, so they are more likely to, to follow along. But the history of drowned men is also the history of, of failure. So <laughs> maybe they'll get the point at some eventually. Interesting the, the way that uh, Aaron notices Balon's downturn in terms of health and how Balon looks like a much older man than he really is. Um, but Aaron does too. Neither of them are nearly that old, but they both have like white hair. And well, Aaron's hair is blackish, I think, or some white. It's like gray, I guess. It's prematurely gray, but he's only like in his 30s. And... Uh, you wonder if there's some guilt from Balon's end, if he feels guilty about what happened with Theon, uh, maybe. But Asha has been captured also, and although not by this point. So, Balon, I guess that's not really an important point. Balon never saw that happen. So, there are lots of kind of stuff below the surface there that we're not sure about. We get some family history with their father, Kellon Greyjoy, who was a really interesting ironborn guy that, that Asha really takes after perhaps more than anyone else. He's the one that was really trying to reform them, but he was just an imposing figure. Like, he looked like an ironborn leader, six foot six ish, like bigger than Victorian, probably, or at least taller, maybe not wider. So, really, a terrifying looking guy, but attitude wise, very different than any of his sons, really. It doesn't seem like any of his sons took after him uh, in, the, uh, in terms of his progressiveness. In fact, they seem to be going alive. the other way. <laughs> any, any that lived. Yeah, right. <laughs> And Bail, uh, Aaron thinks of how them being away at war. And yeah, Kellon died during Robert's Rebellion, during, during kind of a meaningless skirmish near the end. Also important to note the interaction with the maester here. Gorald Goodbrother brings his maester, and uh, Aaron is aggressively anti-maester, not just because of the religion versus science thing, but because of the Uragon. His brother Uragon died... And he believes that if they had healed him the old way, just cutting, you know, treating him with seawater instead of trying to sew the fingers back on, that he would still be alive. So he has this harsh attitude that we got a, a short quote to describe. No proper man would choose a life of thraldom, nor, for, nor forge a chain of servitude to wear about his throat. This is very ironic to hear because Aaron is absolutely a servant of the drowned god. He's absolutely a slave to his beliefs. 
and he ends up in chains of servitude under his brother's uh, capture when Euron puts him in, his, in the hold of his ship. And arguably, Aaron helped him by leading him to the king's mood and, and helping him view Euron with all this power that he was trying to do the opposite of. So he sort of forged his own chain of servitude by empowering Euron so much. Although, clearly, it's that's some victim-blaming, sort of, because it's clearly Euron that's, that's driving all that. But it is still kind of ironic to see him digging his own grave, um, so to speak. Let's see here. And Kirk Evans says, Balon slash Tywin, Cersei slash Asha, Theon slash Jaime. Comparison suggested by parallels in books since book begins with death of both characters. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. There's lots of these pairings. I mean, certainly it's a big part of this early book is the reaction to the deaths of these really important high figures. Um, and just the devastation that comes from those reactions. They know, things don't get better. It's, it's crazy. Balin's a bad leader, but things don't get better with his leadership gone. And Cersei, <laughs> well, I mean, Tywin is terrible, but Cersei's worse, because at least Tywin, you could count on him to do so some things well, or at least organized. <laughs> and he's, he's not a full, complete slave to his paranoia. Um, yeah, uh, Scott McCloy says, interesting that an Ironborn hates horses and the Dothraki hate boats. Yeah, <laughs> and those are, and they're both sort of going to be combined in Daenerys' army. <laughs> Amir Dubai says, well, they're both kind of like pirates. Yeah, Brandon Winslow says land pirates and sea pirates. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the Dothraki only take, they don't build. Yeah, that's, uh, they do not sew either. They, in fact, they hate sewing. They, they think it's religious, it's a religious belief that they do not till the earth. The Dothraki think Mother Earth, it's, it's sinful to put crops in the ground. So they literally think we do not sow. So that is actually a really good comparison on multiple fronts. Uh, another, and Brandon Winslow points out another semi-parallel. In this chapter, the, it's mentioned that, yeah, Ironborn should not spill the blood of Ironborn. Drowning is uh, a way to get around that. No blood may be spilled in Vase Dothrak either. And how did they get around that? Well, with strangling with sil silken cords and with dumping gold on top of Viserys' head, things like that. There we go. Yeah, these proto-animalistic, uh, shamanistic societies have these things in common. Real world and uh, planetos. Zajambadi says, does Euron get away with chopping a Baylor black tide because the latter follows the seven and thus can't be considered ironborn? Yes, absolutely. That's why he can get away with it because Baylor Blacktide worships the Seven, and with the, it's, it's again a good example of Euron just co-opting what Aaron does. It's like Aikido. Aaron does all these things to try to lower Euron's esteem, and Euron's like, "Oh, we're going full worship of the Drowned God." Well, then, what better way to <laughs> to show that I'm on board with that than by killing worshippers of a different god? Yeah, who's going to stand up to him for that? A, they're afraid of him. B, he's got this religious exemption that he can point to and say, look, yeah, worshippers of the seven, Greenlanders, they, need, they deserve death. That, that's going to work. Laura Brandos with a good catch here about uh, referring to his little wordplay. Uh, even a priest may doubt, even a prophet may know terror. Aaron Damphair reached within himself for his God and discovered only... Silence, a.k.a. the name of Euron's ship. And that's where he's going to end up not long after the King's Moot, in the hull of silence, in the belly of the beast, as the chapter says. He also, there's also a similar bit, not quite as powerful piece of wordplay, where one of the lords asks, what answer shall we send? And he says, send only silence. Yeah. Jake Morask from Facebook says, this chapter is a marathon, but I enjoy it a lot. My favorite aspect is the tension we see in the Ironborn society through Aaron's eyes between the obsessively insular-looking culture of the old way that Aaron posits and the outside elements that a number of Ironborn have integrated into their lives as a matter of practicality. Yeah, because as we said earlier, so much of drown, wor drown God worship is rejection of practicality, of things that make life easier. So, uh, Jake... Continues here. The people that Aaron visits that have a maester come to mind and the way trade ships visit the island in general. 
But I think it shows how much more nuance there is to the situation than how the old way ideology constructs things. The tension seems to be, or that tension seems to be a dominating force in Ironborn history, and I think undermines the idea that there is only one true version of the real Ironborn culture that people like Aaron obsessively cling to. Very well said. Yes, Asha is, and her grandfather Kellon, perfect example of people who held to some aspects of Ironborn culture. I mean, there's no doubt Asha is Ironborn. She's a fighter. She's a warrior. She's brave. She's tough. I mean, she's, you know, a comfortable on the deck of a ship, but she's not all about the, she rejects a lot of this dogma of their religion. You don't have to be super religious to be Ironborn. The religion of the Ironborn and the culture of the Ironborn are overlapping, but they are not the same thing. And this is something Jake Morask has pointed to very well here by showing that we can't, don't get too deep into Aaron's way of thinking. Uh, and that's, George does a good job of that by giving us other Ironborn POVs too. Stefan B. really wonders about the finger dance and if Aaron feels guilty over playing the finger dance with Uragon, considering he doesn't play it anymore. Even though he blames someone else for Uragon's death because of the maester, still, he seems to be traumatized by all that and he refuses to ever play again. And damn, is it a strange thing to do, the finger dance? I mean, what? God, it's so, <laughs> it's so brutal. Uh... People on Flick were leading the charge, talking about different ways that this is a new series, not just a whole new location. It just feels so different. There's so many new concepts and cultures. And when we come back, when we come back, this is the second time that we're reading this, or third time, or fourth, or however many times it's been for you, it really stands out more because the first time it's like a fire hose, a, a seawater fire hose of new information. But now you've had time to process, you've seen ahead to the end, and you know what's being foreshadowed, at least some of it. It's a lot easier to manage all these different cultural traditions and attitudes and just so much new data. It's not so new this time. Now you can manage it, you can handle it, and I think that helps it become a lot more interesting uh, when it's not so overwhelming. Great comment, too, from Charlie One One, talking about the concept of memories within bones. Naga's Hill, the, the bones there at uh, Old Wick that we're going to see during the King's Moot and the concept of memories being contained within there. Whether this is a supernatural thing or just a thematic thing, it's, it's an interesting concept because we obviously have actual memories and souls and things like that contained in the Weirwood network and Weirwood trees over time become like bone uh, when they, you know, they become as hard as stone and that you know, has a thematic connection to it. And so the Ironborn's way is being contained in these old things, these old naturalistic elements, the Naga's bones and their own, uh, you know, their own people, this history contained within them. And uh, I just like that concept a lot. It's so dark and mysterious and fits extremely well with the ethos of Ironborn belief and how much just evil is contained. Evil maybe is too harsh a word, but... I mean, they worship a drowned god who is, might just be a different look for Cthulhu, of all things. I mean, you really can't mince about that. <laughs> there's no, like, well, it's, there's a good side to worshiping Cthulhu. <laughs> nah, nah, there's no good side to that. Okay, that is the end of that chapter. That's the end of that chapter. Lots of references to comedy shows today we got the simpsons we got it's always sunny we got uh, the office they're always popping up we are what we are futurama oh yeah futurama too you're right definitely the captain of guards the captain of guards aka the prince is dead aka the sand snakes go directly to jail do not pass go povs do two main things they communicate the thoughts and feelings of the character whose pov we are seeing things through and they show us the events happening around that character this character has been nicknamed the camera that rides <laughs> because he is so very leaned towards Observer and less towards his own personality, though I'm not sure we've actually seen him ride, but whatever, he's big. He's not as big as Gregor, but he is huge. Arya Hota differs, yeah. He's, he's more Observer than internal story, but his own story is interesting too, but it's intentionally done this way because... There's a statement here about love and duty, right? It's, it's an ongoing theme that duty is the death to love. And while Hota has 
love for some of the princesses. He's fond of some of them, and he's, he arguably loves Doran Martell, too. Mostly, he's, he's basically married to his ex. He, he thinks of it as his lady wife, his duty. And while he's not, you know, internally ruined by his duty, he's very focused on his job and doesn't have much of a life outside of it. Almost hardly has any life outside of it. And this is a guy who was basically, I mean, he's kind of a slave. I mean, he has free will, but it's, it's kind of an illusion. And he's so bought into his role that he would, he would never choose to go somewhere else. He, he kind of likes his life, even though to us it's kind of hard to fathom that his upbringing was just because he was basically sold to a priesthood at a young age because he was so big and, and too expensive because of his eating habits being such a large boy. <laughs> his controlled and extremely confident demeanor, though, is an important aspect to his chapters. It keeps us grounded amidst a series of really tense plot lines where, I mean, he's surrounded by very passionate people. Dorne is a passionate country. And it's in a passionate time, emotions running high after the death of the Red Viper. So it's really interesting that he's the calm guy in the storm, where it's the opposite of Aaron, where Aaron is like the angry, obsessed guy in the storm, fighting it back against the storm. And in the prologue, where uh, Pate is sort of oblivious to the storm, <laughs> the Dornisher. So mad about the death of the Red Viper, and this is maybe a, this is also a suggestion of the difference in Dornish belief and Dornish culture, the same sort of insight to their culture that we're getting with the Ironborn, but it's a very different set of insights because they're a very different type of people. Quote. The blood oranges are well past ripe, the prince observed in a weary voice when the captain rolled him onto the terrace. As noted before... Perhaps most recently, I think in Sansa's last chapters in A Storm of Swords, the blood orange is a wonderful symbol for revenge. I mean, the word blood thrown in there is it kind of gets you half the way there. But this is, I mean, blood oranges are a real thing. That they are well past ripe means the time for revenge is past. Well past, meaning you missed your chance. In this one, they show their hatred for Tywin Lannister and rage over what they see as yet another family death at his hands. But the man's dead already. You can't get revenge on Tywin anymore. So, yeah, the time for revenge is past. I mean, you can go get revenge on his family, on his descendants. But Tywin Lannister himself is forever out of your reach. It's not just the blood oranges that are overripe and ready to burst. Doran Martell himself, the way his feet and joints are described is grotesquely reddened. And his toes look like they're going to burst. It's, it's a subtle suggestion that he himself, it's like the... The need for revenge has filled him and sort of ruined him. It's a toxic re need for revenge. and It's taking a physical toll. Stress is obviously a real thing that can have a long-term affliction on you. And while this seems to be partly genetic, partly, you know, legitimately uh, genetic or something, I don't know the source of, of it, but his long struggle and suffering and the pain Doran has felt, emotional pain Doran has felt throughout his life. And it's so palpable in this chapter. Hota, that's part of why I think Hota genuinely loves Doran is he feels for his prince and notices his suffering and his, his, his qualities as an observer often focus on that. And there's also maybe a joke about the blood oranges being well past right. Maybe that's a meta joke that Nina suggests that it's a nod to the abandonment of the five-year gap. Part of the reason the, the gap was abandoned was this plot line, the reaction, the visceral, passionate reaction to Oberyn's death that we're seeing through this more calm and coolly collected man. And, well, if it had been another five-year gap, I mean, if it had actually been a five-year gap, damn, think of how <laughs> really past ripe this revenge could have been. <clears throat> also, Nina, with a nice catch here, Doran mentions that he and Oberyn were eating oranges before Oberyn left for the capital, which is another sign that they were planning vengeance together, though mm, not what they had actually planned actually happened because, well, they could not have predicted the stuff with Tyrion and all that, the trial. But regardless, there's no revenge on the dead. And yeah, they're going to go after some of the other ones, but you know, like Gregor Clegane, 
And uh, if, if Sir Robert Strong, <laughs> the kyborg, is going to emerge, or when he emerges, I, I kind of doubt he can conceptualize revenge. So he's not going to know what's happening <laughs> if they, when they come for him, if they come for him. So he's not going to feel, oh, they got me. He's just, I mean, he's, I think he's just an automaton with maybe some vague, vague one, two percent of humanity left in him. So he's not going to suffer either. Although he has suffered, thanks to the manticore venom. But in general, I'm just going to be really curious to see how the Sand Snakes interact with Robert Strong. We know they're going to King's Landing, uh, several of them, later. and we, But we haven't seen that happen yet. But again, as other men, like Kevin Lannister himself, says, like, everyone knows who that is. Because no one else was that big. And he's still associated with the same person he was associated with before, which is the House Lannister. So he's like, Robert Stone is clearly Gregor Clegane, right? And the Sand Snakes are not dumb. And I think you would have to be dumb to not make that connection if you're presented with it in person. So <laughs> I just, I'm really eager to see what they do and or say about when they encounter this thing and are like, that's clearly Clegane. <laughs> what, are, what are you trying to pull here? Whose head was that that you sent us? So, in general, not just him, though. He's not the only Kingsguard we have to talk about here. If I were to compare Hota to another POV, I'd go with Barristan. You know, he's, he's put up against Balon Swan and Ares Oakheart, and, you know, we're, we're discussing Robert Strong here, but it's Barristan, I think, that fits best. And another man who, from a very young age, is dedicated to duty, whose abilities and culture really defined his life ahead of time. A guy as good at fighting as Barristan Selmy, who was raised by a noble knightly family, that, like, the way his life went was almost predictable. Like, assuming he isn't killed or something, but and no one knew that he could be this famous, perhaps. But it's a very similar upbringing. Like, Hota, when did Hota have a choice to be anything other than what he turned out to be? Hota arguably had even less choice. But really, they have, the other thing that defines them is that they are incredible at fighting, and they know it, and have this just deep-seated, sincere, not arrogant confidence. And also, well, this quote, just re let's look at this quote and, and just kind of think about how it applies to Barristan and his ideas of just trying to keep things simple, but how they're not staying simple. The world is becoming unsimple even as they try to stay simple. He was only a captain of guards, and still a stranger to this land and its seven-faced god, even after all these years, serve, obey, protect. He had sworn those vows at six and ten, the day he wed his axe. Simple vows for simple men, the bearded priests had said. He had not been trained to counsel grieving princes. That's super similar to what Selmy is thinking as he's at Marine going, this is a strange land that I'm not used to, like, and I'm not supposed to be doing this kind of job, like being a queen's hand. And he specifically helps ease Quentin Martell's passing after his horrible burning. Not a job he's trained for. Not been trained to counsel grieving slash dying princes. Literally a prince in this case, Prince Quentin. So I, I can't help but notice all those commonalities there. Now... As I mentioned earlier, Hota himself doesn't know Barristan very well. He's probably only heard of him. So he's comparing himself to Marcella's guardian, a different white knight. Well, that's how the quote starts. The white knight. The captain frowned. Sir Ares had come to Dorne to attend his own princess, as Arya Hota had once come with his. Even their names sounded oddly alike, Ario and Ares. Yet, there the likeness ended. The captain had left Norvos and its bearded priests, but Ser Aris Oakheart still served the Iron Throne. Hota had felt a certain sadness whenever he saw the man in the long, snowy cloak, the times the prince had sent him down to Sunspear. One day, he sensed, the two of them would fight. On that day, Oakheart would die with the captain's long axe, with the captain's long axe crashing through his skull. He slid his hand along the smooth ashen shaft of his axe and wondered if that day was drawing nigh. So that foreshadows Ario versus Aris like straightforward. It's more than foreshadowing. It's dead on great. I mean, it's he doesn't literally have his head, his axe crash into his skull. He has his 
axe chop his head off, so <laughs> close enough. And it just shows. He's like, just yeah, look, he's a king's guard. He's probably a good warrior, but he's not going to beat me. I'm our, and, and again, there's just no cockiness, no arrogance in this sentiment. He just, on honest assessment, he's like, no, that guy can't beat me. <laughs> and it's, and it, as we see, he definitely can't. It didn't, doesn't seem like it would have been close under any circumstance. It, it was just, boom, done. And it reminds us just how terrifying Aryo Hota is if he's fighting. Now, that last line, though, the captain's long ass, long, long ass. <laughs> the captain's long axe crashing through his skull and thinking about how he would just defeat some other great warrior and how that might. Ha- it also reminds me of Victorian, especially because Victorian is the iron captain and he prefers to fight with an axe himself. So with the captain's long axe crashing through his skull, that could be a Victorian line. However, I do not expect Victorian and Aryo Hota to ever fight. I don't think Victorian's making it out of Slaver's Bay. Now, recall too, though, as just as Ario Hota is extremely confident about beating Aris Okart if they fight or when they fight, as he thinks, he has a different attitude to Balon Swan. We'll get to that eventually, but for now, as a comparison, he does not see Balon Swan as a pushover, although he still thinks he would win. He, he thinks Balon Swan is, is clearly uh, more skilled, and that's true. Balon Swan is more skilled, as far as we know, from what we've seen. And like I uh, touched on earlier, Hota seems to legitimately care for, if not love, Doran. And it's easy to guess that the physical ailments are part of that. He he sees day in, day out, more so than anyone other than Doran himself, even more than his children, Doran's children, that is, that how constant this pain is. So Hota is by his side all the time, witnessing him suffer and getting constant reminders of it. So I would think that imbues some significant sympathy so Arian Martel uh, is mentioned, uh, and then we get several, you know, we, we get several of the Sand Snakes appearing, giving us more important introductions. And we already met one of the Sand Snakes in the prologue already with uh, Sorella. We went through that already. I won't repeat that. So we've got the four oldest Sand Snakes in play already, with the fifth coming up in Arian's The Winds of Winter chapter. The other three are too young to have agency, so if they enter the story... Maybe it's because time has passed, but it's more likely that if young kids are being involved in the story, it's probably not for things that will be good for them. Children involved in the Game of Thrones don't do terribly well, after all, almost ever. Uh, And along with that ominous thought, only ten guards remain at the Water Gardens after Doran and Arya leave, and that is not a very big number of guards protecting children. Uh, Yeah. To borrow from Star Wars, the Water Gardens, I got a bad feeling about this. All those children, such a beautiful place of peace. How could something not go wrong? Uh, I I go into more detail with this in our Nymeria episodes, particularly the first one, which describes the similarity between the water gardens right down to the color of marble and one of the old Roynish cities that was destroyed by Dragonfire. Hmm. In fact, it was the water gardens of the Roin. (laughs) So, yeah, yikes. So a bit about each of the three Sand Snakes introduced in this chapter is in order. Know your Sand Snake. Before we look at individuals, let's look at them collectively as a group. They could be seen as like reflections or extensions of their father. Sure, they, they're individuals. They have their own personalities. But each one of them has some represents some major part of his life or his skill set or his attitudes, if not multiple parts. The Dornish have a look, rather, several looks, depending on which subculture of Dorn we're talking about, sandy, stony, salty, or in between, because they certainly, you know, marry, intermarry a decent bit. But the Martells don't have, like, a look like the Starks do or the Lannisters do. But Oberyn's daughters, many of them, have his look, especially his distinct widow's peak. Three of the four have it so far. Uh, Tyene is the exception because she looks more like her mother in general. Blonde, no widow's peak. And number five, Elia doesn't have the widow's peak either, but she does have the dark coloring and eyes of her father. So mostly they look like their dad. First of all, the eldest Obara quote. Quick and strong as she was, the woman was no match for him, he knew. But she did not, and he had no wish to see her blood upon the pale pink marble. Similarities to Aaron in terms of the self-confidence again, but it's not 
<laughs> this is rational self-confidence where Aaron's is from zealotry <laughs> and, and arrogance. He doesn't believe himself more important or above the Sand Snakes. He's just, again, thinking of the facts. And he's probably right again. And he's probably summed up the situation about right. She doesn't know that she can't beat him, but he's, he knows <laughs> that she can't. <laughs> and Obara is very confident, too. Yeah, her confidence maybe is the more misplaced confidence, but it's it's very much in line with her father being cocky, being a little bloodthirsty, being outspoken. Right now, we don't know how good of a fighter she is. I mean, I doubt she's bad, but she's maybe not amazing or anything. I, I'm skeptical that she's as good as her father, but I do want to find out. I'd like to see her in action. We're meant to think perhaps that his aggressive nature was passed down like nature rather than, or like nurture rather than nature, yet the example of Obara choosing the spear over her mother's tears when she was just a two-year-old or something, or three-year-old, that suggests that a nod towards nature, but it's such a, man, that is, that's rough to read. That is a terrible look for Oberyn. I mean, we were never supposed to think of Oberyn as a good guy, but that is really just, the way he treated her mother is, ugh. and and Obara herself just, is right along with it. She's like, yeah, my mother was weak. Screw her. Like, eesh, no wonder you're such an angry person all the time. And look, and, and as an example of her uh, just attitude is not it's terribly rational. She just, she's more passion than planning at this point. But keep in mind, she's, her father has just died and she's still reacting to it. So here's just an example, though. And how could you hope to hold Old Town? It would be enough to sack it. The wealth of Hightower. Is it gold you want? It is blood I want. With the worry about Euron and Old Town, let's not forget about Obara. <laughs> like, Euron seems more likely to, to accomplish that, but Obara's stating that same goal. So, mm, two chapters in, and we've already got multiple people wanting to take down Old Town. <laughs> so, so, all these worries we had in the prologue and already are already looking strong. But the more important part of the quote is at the end, there's no tactical or even financial reason to want to attack Old Town. She just wants blood and death and vengeance. We know vengeance is a major theme throughout the entire series, but the idea of only wanting blood is particularly strong when considering a feast for crows. We're going to see a lot of that. The endless cycle and the need for violence. There's a lot because we're starting off with people having died, and some of this is going to need to be answered. Some people are going to need to pay for these deaths, whether it's Tywin, whether it's Balon, whether it's the Red Viper, perhaps most of all, uh, in terms of immediate reactions. But also, Obarl hates Old Town because, well, she was born there. Her mother's from there, and she maybe has this trauma of being associated with it and her bad memories that she's she probably should be associating with how her father treated her and how her father treated her mother, but she, I don't know if she's projecting it onto the city itself. I'm not really sure. I'm not a psychologist, so don't take me too far on that guess. But she definitely hates Old Town, and she was born there. So there's a connection, uh, whether I could specifically point to it or not. And But it's so weird, too. Like, you can see why she's projecting. Like, she's like, this will be revenge. This is why Doran's like, why the Hightower? What do they have to do with... They didn't do anything. (laughs) Like, they're an ancient enemy of ours. They're an old foe of of Doran. But connecting them to your father's death is crazy. Like, the Hightowers aren't allied with the Lannisters right now. The Hightowers are doing their own thing. They're kind of... Ignoring the Lannisters, they, they hardly participated in the War of Five Kings even. They played both sides during Robert's Rebellion. This is misplaced, <laughs> this anger. And that's a part of Obara. Consider, too, that she's the first to appear and first disappear. In terms of Arya's future, she's going to be connected to him as they go hunting Darkstar with Sir Balin Swan. And, well, maybe Obara is going to turn and join Darkstar. Because if you think about what Darkstar's attitudes are, think about how he's just wanting to start a war and he's all about, yeah, let's just get, get going and, and cause some blood and chaos. Like, Obara's going to, if she hears that, she'll be like, that's kind of what I was saying. <laughs> let's, not too, let's not forget, too, that in the histories, the Danes have attacked Old Town as well. And, well, Darkstar, you never know. Mm, we'll see. 
Nina points out that Doran tells Obara he'll send word to her at Sunspear, and Obara responds, so long as the word is war. In Ariane 1 to wins a winner, Ariane notes that one word and those armies would march, so long as that word was dragon. If instead the word she sent was war, Lord Ironwood and Lord Fowler and their armies would remain in place. So Dor- Doran has flipped the instruction so that war means do nothing and dragon means attack. So uh, that's a little wordplay there that Obara's like, as long as the word is war, well, Obara, if the word is war, that means do nothing. So <laughs> you've, been, you've been tricked slightly there, or will be. Next up, Nymeria. Uh, the name, there's a lot to say about her name, but look to the same place if you want history on Nymeria, the Nymeria episodes I mentioned earlier. Nymeria's mother is from Volantis, which is kind of funny because the original Nymeria was a, an enemy of Volantis, given it was the Freehold versus the Rhoynish cities, and, and Volantis was one of their colonies at the time. Still, it'll be interesting to see if Nymeria's parentage is relevant after Daenerys comes into heavy conflict with the ruling families there. She's already in some conflict with the ruling families there in her assault on the slave trade. And much has been said about the old blood of, Vol- of Volantis, the old Volantines that are connected to the Freehold. They consider themselves the heirs of Valyria more so than anyone else, both from proximity to Valyria and in blood relationships. And well, Nymeria's mother is extremely highborn and, again, Volantine. So there could be some conflict there, although that might just be too distant to matter. She is well armed with daggers. I will have to wait to see what she does with those daggers. Nymeria suggests to Doran uh, and Tyene that they kill the Lannisters and Tommen in payment for Oberyn, Elia, and her children. That might be what happens. With Tyene headed towards King's Landing to take up with the High Sparrow and Nymeria going to King's Landing as uh, her father's replacement on the small council, they're going to be well positioned to take revenge against Tommen and maybe Marcella and other Lannisters or maybe Tyrells or just people at court. They're just going to be in a spot where they have some power to wield and their enemies are going to be wary of them probably because... Well, they're the daughters of Oberyn, and everybody knew to be wary of him, so, you know. Once they meet the daughters, they're going to realize, well, they're cut from the same cloth. Tyene, let's talk about her. She's the one that looks the most different, probably, arguably, from their father. You could maybe make the case for Sorella because of the skin color, but whatever. The point is, she's blonde hair and doesn't have the widow's peak. Looks more, looks more like her mother. She's the one who says, crown Marcella, and let the, let the realm try to attack Dorne and use their home field advantage to, to defeat these invading armies because invading outside of Dorne, taking their armies outside of Dorne, probably wouldn't work that well. They're just too outnumbered. So this is a good plan, at least as far as considering the armies that are out there in the world and their chance of success. And sure enough, she's the one that's closest to Ariane. So this idea of Marcella's crowning may have been floated by Arianne through Tyene, or maybe it was Tyene's idea first, but whatever, the idea comes from that corner of the world, of, of, this, of this family. And so it seems like Tyene's floating the idea to Doran, saying, hey, well, what do you think about doing this? And then he rejects that idea, obviously, and so that's when I suppose we can say Arianne takes matters into her own hands and is like, I'll go. if my dad's not going to crown Marcella, we're going to do it. So they're the, basically the same age. Tyene and Ariane, like within a year. So that's, that explains partly why they bonded so much because they were on the same sort of educational highborn track. You know, their parents were so close, etc. So they just had a lot in common. And Tyene also mentions that she was told by Damon Sand, who was uh, with Oberyn, helped him, you know, he was his squire, uh, and gave him a, sent a letter about the poison used on Sir Gregor. Tyene is a poisoner. She knows all about poison. And she's, this also makes her skeptical that the head of Gregor is worth anything. It's like, Doran's like, well, they're going to send us the head of Gregor. And she's like, so? That dude's already been poisoned by manticore venom. His life's already forfeit. He's already dead. They're not executing him. They're executing a man that's dying of poison anyway. So she doesn't think that's worth much. And I suppose it's not a question of if she'll poison someone, but whom? That's a big open question with Tyene. One, two, many? Who's she going to poison? Like, you can't set up a poisoner like this and not have them poison someone, I think. Because she's not, she's not shown to be incompetent. She's shown to be skilled, trained by her father. This is going to matter. <laughs> 
Boros Blunt is Tommen's food taster. He's a possibility. Might as well round out the rest of the Kingsguard. Throw all the names out here during this episode. <laughs> Kyburn, too. That's a possibility. He's the one that animated Sir Gregor. You could see why they might have a grievance on that front. <laughs> it's like, you brought him back? The guy that killed my kin? Mm, and my father? I don't think so. And if they, if, but if the Sand Snakes turn on their own family, like we see on TV, Doran himself, if not Hota, could be poisoned. And in fact, that is suggested here slightly by Doran even hesitating to touch her. And then when she leaves, the maester comes to check to make sure she hasn't. They're worried already about Tyene poisoning Doran. That just goes to show how much of a tightrope walk this all is for Doran. And it's so painful when you really think about it because he's in such pain, not just physically, but emotionally. And he's kind of on an island. He's, he's trying to do the right thing. And no, one, and no one's really with him. They're all working against him, even as whether it's the lowborn or the highborn. But he's more clear-sighted than most on some things. Yet, you still want him to do something. You still want him to not mess it up. But sending Quentin to Daenerys looks like a mistake. I mean, it, maybe it's just looking at things in 2020 hindsight. But I, it's hard to imagine that it would have ever worked. <laughs> you know, given the type of person Quentin is. As far as other murders, poisoning possibilities, Marcella and Tom, and obviously are on the table. Cersei herself, though, not likely, considering the foreshadowing for Cersei's death seems to land her elsewhere. Quick mention, too, how different Ilaria is in the books. Ilaria is, like, all over the place in the show, being at the front of things, leading her daughters, or her related, or her not daughters. <laughs> not all those daughters are her, only the younger ones. So, but, but in, and she's not in this chapter, so we'll talk about her later when she comes back. But again, a reminder that book Ilaria is polar opposite of, of show Ilaria. She's like pushing hard for peace. She's perhaps one of Doran's few allies. We just haven't seen her speak up yet because Doran wants peace. Doran is, I mean, she wants peace even more than Doran. She doesn't even want the, the like the basic revenge that Doran's keeping under wraps about Elia. Joe also is a big fan of this Aria, Aria chapter, talking about how likable he is as a person, unlike, uh, say, you know, Aaron. <laughs> and uh, Maester Caliot, good mention of Maester Caliot here, not a major player in this chapter or in general, but lots of Maester action in general throughout this, this first few chapters. You got Maesters, you get the Citadel, obviously. We got the good brother Maester that argues with Aaron, or rather the other way around, and then Caliot here looking for poison. And Caliot's going to be around later, too. I kind of figure he's doomed <laughs> because of his association with these guys, but eh, maybe not. Nina mentions, first we had the prologue in Leo Tyrell mocking the maesters as a menagerie that refused to believe in the return of the supernatural. Then we have Aaron and his open religious personal distrust of the maesters. Now we have Ariel Hota dismissing Maester Caliot as not the equal of the Sand Snakes. Uh, you know, he's he's not insulting Caliot, but he's like, if, if the Sand Snakes were to try to you know, make a move here, Caliot would be helpless. So it's another just honest, harsh uh, estimation of the situation that, that Hota gives us, which is nice because that kind of clarity is rare in a lot of these POVs for Feast because so many of them are subject to, to being lied to or... Like in Aaron's, hair, Aaron's case, he's such a zealot that his thoughts are all messed up and filtered through strange religious conception. And Cersei is just so paranoid and people are lying to her constantly. So you get this. That's something about Arya's, Arya's uh, chapters that I appreciate, um, that they're more straightforward. Even though there's lots of subtlety in subtext. Um, so much pain, as we said, from Doran, a little more specific. We talked about his physical pain, but just... This quote, I was the oldest, the prince said, and yet I am the last. Watching his own f family die and, and thinking, tying that to his upbringing when he despaired of ever having siblings again because his mother, there were some stillborns and all that and deaths in the cradle. And he finally did get siblings that he had given up hope on. And then he outlives them both. It's so painful. That really did. Like, you don't want to spend too much time thinking about Doran because it's just, it's hard. I think it gets, even though they're siblings, it, it gets at the idea of parents outliving their kids, too. 
Yeah, you're right. That's kind yes. of why it's particularly sad, I think. Which he's done also since yeah. he doesn't even know Quentin's dead no, yet. So that's, that's also true. happened. Yeah. And, and and I don't know that Tristane is going to make it either. <laughs> you know, I mean, no. I don't think he's going to die like he did in the show. But he might. He might. Or he might just die in a different way. It might not be the same people that do it. But, yeah. And... Uh, another little clue here that maybe not all the sand snakes are on the same page, even though they seem to be here, is that Sorella likes Old Town as much as Obara hates it. And you wonder if that even matters. But it is at least context and, and uh, yeah. What does Nymeria want? It's the same as Obara, but vengeance. They all, they're all after vengeance here. This is such a big deal. They're all, it, it, it goes to show how vengeance passes from generation to generation. Oberyn and Doran have been after revenge from a prior generation, and their quest for it has led them to bring this next generation into it fully, and there's no stopping it now. Um, Joe Buckley mentions also how cool it is that we get to see Sunspear and some of the Shadow City throughout these chapters. He loves the architecture. It's the last great castle we're ever introduced to. Um, of course, that will probably change with the new book, but as of Casterly this point, Rock. <laughs> what's that? Because of Casterly Rock. Yeah, Casterly Rock, maybe Highgarden. And I, I must say, by the way, um, in the subject of Sunspear, um, if you don't have Michael's Dorn map, uh, Michael Carfeld, or you haven't looked at it close, there's a, a great look at Sunspear there. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Um, a couple of random thoughts from Nina. It's fitting that Ario thinks of Obara's approach as a drumbeat of boots because she is coming to propose war and is just dead set on war and blood and all that. So it's like a drumbeat. The, the pounding of drums is like a march of war. So it's George playing with language there. But it's also very ominous to have that happening at the Water Gardens. This, the drumbeats of war amidst the happy, carefree sounds of the children playing at the Water Gardens is... Well, you'd rather those kids get to play in peace and it, it never have to face this the drum beats of war, but the drum beats of war are going to come find them, I fear, if not something worse. Friendly reminder that despite learning the names of Doran's dead younger brothers who were only alive for a year or less, Olivar and Moors, we still don't know the name of the unnamed princess of Dorne. I mean, she's history. Why would we know her name? <laughs> According to George, she is quoting she's George. dead. <laughs> no, I am quoting him. My very first convention. I had my question already. I get. I, I stand up. Uh, he just read from Con Carolina. This was what's from. He just read the first excerpt from World of Ice and Fire about the Westerlands, all about history, dead <laughs> characters. And I ask him, do we know her name? Well, she's dead. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, we know that. Yes, she's dead. <laughs> but it's not like she was the the married half, like the in the the brought from the outside. She was the Martell in this marriage. She her her the father was from some other house. Yeah, so she was the, the princess of Dorne, the <laughs> ruler of Dorne. So she's the uh, most recent ruler of a major area that we don't have the name for, and she's referred to a lot, but not by name. So yeah. uh, we'll get her name, I think, because I'm I'm optimistic. A lot of people have brought it up to George. Um, and we'll continue to push on him to, to make that. And I'm happen. only three of them. <laughs> uh, nice take from Nina here. The vocal crowd reactions in Sunspear, I think, are telling of how Doran will react when Doran rolls the dice for Aegon. Yep. We wondered about how the Sand Snakes are going to kind of react to Aegon, but Doran, too, is, is, is a worthy question here. There's already a notable and very vocal segment of the population with views Oberyn's death as grossly wrong and an event that demands reaction, or if not vengeance. The Baratheon-Lannister regime came to power in the wake of deaths of Elia and her children, more Dornishmen, and prevented the Dornish from ascending to the throne eventually, something they were probably looking forward to or proud of, uh, but that was cut off brutally and violently. And so now Doran's like putting down uh, the, the seeds of rebellion here, and then... Uh, after the Roberts Rebellion, you know, Oberyn was maybe trying to get people going for Viserys, and that was that was shut down. So the locals have seen Doran dodge 
these opportunities from for vengeance many times. That's what it looks like to them. We know that he's not dodging, that he's just being more cautious. Even if you think he's being too cautious, you can't say he's not actually doing anything. Uh, even if you don't think his plans were smart, it's not that he's got, it's not that he's doing nothing. So, uh, the Dornish people, you can see in part why they're just so tired of, of taking it without fighting back. And they're also a place that's more recently brought into the picture. They have a longer tradition of independence than even the Ironborn. The Ironborn have been, you know, under the guise of the, under the auspices of the Seven Kingdoms for a long time. Their break was more recent and it failed. Dorne is maybe thinking they could go back to that, or at least, like, they're not calling for independence, but they're calling for civil war that, you know, they can't, they can't miss the possibility that a result of such an action would, would, would perhaps push them towards independence again. You're fighting back against the crown, and doesn't always, uh, doesn't always go well, so you have, they have to think that that's a possibility. Yet Dorne has only been, in, has only been part of the Seven Kingdoms for, you know, 100 years or so. A little, little over that, but not much more. So they're more independent-minded in the first place because they've been less a part of the Seven Kingdoms uh, for that time frame. Um, N. Kirk Evans says, Danny's an interesting contrast to Ariane. She continues, continually questions what she knows and whether she's getting it right, which might be connected to why she is more competent than Ariane. Okay, yeah, good point. Yeah, that's a good point. It, like, that is their, their thought. Like, at first, Ariane is a little rash and doesn't think things through. And after making her mistakes and seeing what went wrong, her attitudes really change. She seems to be a different person, and she's a little more cautious. Maybe that's, uh, she starts to think a little more like Daenerys, having learned through her mistakes. Um, that's a good call. Yeah, I like that. Little very small note here. Obara notes that the seps are packed to bursting and the red priests have lit their temple fires. This is the second mention of red priests as an established religion force in Westeros beyond Melisandre. We wonder how extensive it is. Um, Sunspear is, you know, on the coast. Coastal places are a little more likely to have foreign religions. But Jamie... F Jamie's going to mention in his fifth chapter that Relorism is spreading in the Riverlands as well partly because of the Brotherhood Without Banners, I would think. But it's setting up little mentions like this, and also the mention in the prologue chapter just goes to show that there are there is a presence of Red Priests throughout Westeros that appears to be on the rise, especially given they're definitely on the rise in places like Volantis, <laughs> which we mentioned earlier in this chapter. It's connected to Nymeria's mother. So there's just a lot of chat um, in our various social media outlets have how different Dorne is, not just the reactions to Oberyn's death and how, like compare that to Balon's death. They didn't react the same way. Of course, to them, it was falling from a bridge and not, you know, killed by an enemy. So you wonder how the Ironborn re would react if Balon had been killed by some Greenlander. But still, it's a much different sort of thing. The general aspect, attitude of the people, the feel of the place, desert versus, you know, Bleak Islands, hmm. really, really there. Jake Moore asks with another great uh, comment here. It's actually a quote from George. George R. Martin says, Dorne was a nation apart from the other six kingdoms until 100 years ago. So yes, they have a greater sense of nationality. And this is, that absolutely speaks to their reaction to his death, their reaction to being pushed around, their unhappiness at being pushed away from the royal family, things like that. So yeah, the Dornish are more... Um, proud about their heritage and they consider themselves a little more separate because they've they haven't been as mixed into the rest of the kingdoms because you consider the iron independence like i said with the iron islands it's a new thing for them more it's it's again it's becoming new again to them all right that does it that was uh that was a very long first episode you can see why we only started with three chapters mostly it was that first one the prologue is a monster of a chapter it isn't as long as some of the other chapters. I mean, it's not short. It's one of the longer ones, but it doesn't quite, it does more with its length than a lot of other long chapters do just because it touches on so many different things. And we always try to go beyond as much as we can in these early chapters to set up what else is coming in the books. We have, we have more work cut out for us at the beginning because we're trying to prepare you for what else is coming. Through the book, we're just journeying and we have less to set up because we've already set it up here. 
But we will have more setup to do because we haven't hit nearly all the chapter ones that are in this book. This week we covered 136 minutes and 11 seconds of the audiobook. There's 2,030 minutes and 35 seconds in A Feast for Crows, so over 800 minutes fewer than A Storm of Swords, but only about five minutes more than A Game of Thrones. It's really close to the same length as A Game I of Thrones. I want to point out that in our document, you know, you write last week, this week, so yeah. far. Aziz did write last week, zero. I did bother to put the zero there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this didn't record yesterday. I mean, last week. <laughs> <laughs> a little too thorough there, perhaps. Uh, 6.7% of the book we covered today. Normally, we're going to cover more like 8 to 9% because we're normally going to do about four chapters. But, you know, like I said, these were so beefy <laughs> and so much to say about them. As usual, you can check the video length, compare it to the podcast length, see how much we edit out. It tends to be about 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes as high as 30, but usually not that high. Next week. Cersei won. The hand is dead, a.k.a. wow, Cersei really is like that. Brienne won. The one with sparrows heading south for winter, a.k.a. the gang meets hedge knights. Samwell won. The one with crows heading south for winter, a.k.a. Castle Black Library teaser. And finally, Arya won. The gang meets the titan of Braavos, a.k.a. Arya Stark, eater of worms. We mentioned quite a lot of our other episodes, our scripted episodes during this one. The A Feast for Crows prologue patrons only episode, but then a lot of regular episodes that aren't patrons only, like our Nymeria series, which has two of the three episodes completed. Her time, which includes the, the ships fleeing from the Rhoyne, the destruction of the Rhoynish cities, their war against Valyria, and their flight from there. Then the second episode deals with their time in Sothorios trying to make that work, which, you know, didn't, but it sure is interesting, their tries. Our episodes on Ashai and the Great Empire of the Dawn were mentioned. Those, have, those, those tie into both the ancient dragon lore as well as the, the oily black stone, as well as just ancient history that some of this might be touching on. We mentioned our Doom episode, which is a shorter one that focuses specifically on just the Doom of Valyria only and some of the aftermath. And we talked about our Fire and Blood Faceless Man in the Iron Bank episode for obvious reasons with the connection to Jockin and his coin and possible what it says about Arya's story. So there's a lot that came up in Fire and Blood that added to what we know about them. So you're, you're going to want to check that out if you haven't, if you're interested in, in that subtopic. Um... Shea is the best. She proves that week in and week out. And always want to make sure that that credit is given because it is due. Joe and Nina, thanks to y'all as well for your invaluable help with filling out the information and the wording of these episodes. Thank you very much to our History of Westeros mods for leading the charge in the discussion groups vis-a-vis -vis posting chapters with art and discussion points that also helps unearth new nuggets and thoughts that we hadn't considered. Again, you can join us for the discussions ahead of time. Flick, Facebook, Slack, and Discord. Not just Valerie Redis, but just those are our communities. we got lots of things going on, whether you're talking about uh, other stuff in the books, just having, you know, sharing jokes and memes that happen sometimes. I'll just all it's just a community and you can pick which one works best for you or none you know doesn't you don't have to join certainly no pressure thanks of course to Claradox that's Michael Clarfeld's site he makes the maps you see behind me our video intro and, and we referenced him in this episode that's true we and did. his Dorn map we sure did thanks to Kevin McLeod for the Valar Reredis music Thanks to Joey Townsend for the regular History of Westeros music and Jesse Kowal for the cover of that music, which we use for our outro. Thanks to our Benjineer for his audio assistance. He makes the episodes sound better. I do the cutting of ums and uhs and all that, so it's kind of a, a, a we're a team there. Ashea does, the vid does video editing and all sorts of stuff. But sometimes we, we pass jobs around. It's, I know it's hard for you all to keep track of exactly what we're doing behind the scenes. So I try to update you every once in a while. Yeah, I do. For example, I do audio editing if we have a video that I've done all the video editing for. Yeah. So don't let me try to take all the credit for that. Just, you know, we all do our, we all do bits and pieces here and there. Thanks very much to our patrons. 
for making this show financially viable. Anyone who sends donations or just clicks like and comments or tells your friends, that really does matter, whether it's on iTunes or YouTube or whichever podcatcher you use. It really, it really, really does matter. Telling your friends is the number one way. Word yeah. of mouth. Yes. Word Having of mouth someone, is... Just think about yourself. If, if someone directly tells you, check out this show, you are so much likely to check it out than if you just see an article. Yeah. I mean, getting word of mouth from a friend you trust, hearing their enthusiasm, that's, that sells me on things more than just about anything else. Well, as always, at the end of Valar Reread Us, if you're, especially if you're watching live, but even if you're not, head on over to the Here Be Dragons YouTube channel. Today they're doing a dragon moot with San Rixian as a guest. And a bunch of other people that you will know from this chat and other chats. Yeah, so check them out. Show them some love. They're, they do a wide variety of topics over there. This one's a little more uh, fitting for what we're talking about because they don't only do a Song of Ice and Fire stuff. They do lots of other fandoms. So, But this one happens to be related and that's cool so extra motivation to go check them out they're always on at six eastern we we're, we're sort of cutting into their time a little bit today but that's uh that's we usually don't do that not as bad as the other week <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, we cut like halfway into that's it. true yeah because we had a false start there didn't yeah. we yeah there wasn't much we could do about that but <sighs> we really uh, we appreciate uh steven positioning his show right after hours so, so everybody can have spent a... like an hour and a half like almost an hour and a half on just one chapter and then the rest just sped through yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's such a beast of a chapter. I love it. But we but also it's just you don't have as much time. We don't we don't get to come back to it as much. You know, Sam's chapters are gonna go other places even though they're in the same yeah. location. Whereas we'll have more Ironborn and more Dorn. In case we miss something, we can circle back to it. But it's hard to circle back to that pate chapter. All right, folks. Feast for Crows is underway. Three chapters in the books, a lot more to go, eleven more weeks of a feast for crows. We don't have any breaks planned. We might have a break plan so the schedule might change slightly but with the world and the state it's in we're not likely to do much travel for obvious reasons so we should have a nice steady stream of Valerie Redis without interruption for quite a while we hope you join us for it either during or after we welcome all your feedback on the show itself or the content within and we'll see you next week for more Valerie Redis.